you guys are selecting Merrick for your telehealth platform needs. They have a couple different ways that they go about doing this. The first is through a self-selected experience. So there's a table talk panel, which is the full panel. That would be the panel that I personally get twice a year. That's checking everything. You name it, it's all there. The other panel is a checkup panel with a guided optimization. You're connected with a patient care coordinator and the patient care coordinator will meet with you to determine what your needs are. Thing to be able to help optimize your health or mitigate without judgment. So the discount code again is Table Talk Merrick Health for all your hormone optimization and performance needs. Today's episode is brought to you by Element, a tasty electrolyte drink mix with everything that you need and nothing that you don't. In other words, no sugar, no artificial coloring, no artificial ingredients, no gluten, no fillers, and no BS. With Element, I love the watermelon. The watermelon tastes freaking awesome. I drank one pack every day, no matter what, people that train out here, it's sitting out here for them all the time. The boxes don't last very long. Right now, Element is offering Table Talk listeners a free sample pack with any purchase. That's eight single serving packages free with any Element order. Get yours at drinkelement.com backslash Table Talk. The deal is only available through the link in the description. The other thing is if you don't like it, you can just give it away to a salty friend and Element will give you a 100% refund no risk, money back guarantee. Head over to drinkelement.com backslash table talk. Hey guys, if you're a strength athlete, coach, trainer, or practitioner, the Swiss Symposium in Columbus, Ohio at the Easton Town Center, time's running out. It's October 20, 21st, and we have a $200 discount running right now. As I said, seats are starting to fill. So head over to EliteFTS.com, register today. Today's episode is brought to you by EliteFTS.com. Founded in 1998 with the primary aim to live, learn, and pass on. Please help Elite FTS support this mission by smashing the like button, leaving a comment, sharing with a friend, and thinking of us for your training needs. If you can put it in a gym bag or load weights on it, Elite FTS has it. What's going on? I'm Dave Tate. We are broadcasting from the middle of the Elite FTS weight room, where the underground still thrives and you're part of the crew. It's time to sit down, keep it real, and cut the bullshit. Welcome to Table Talk. Strength and physical strength development. Right. And you've been doing this for decades. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of the easiest way to jump into this. Right. Anything you want to throw into there that I may have left out? No, I'm saying I've been, I'm, I'm 42 years old now and I've been doing this since um, I'm 16. So I started working at a gym at that point. It was a hardcore bodybuilding powerlifting gym. And I would work there at nights after football and stuff. And so I got to in, see a lot of advanced bodybuilders and thing and meet bouncers and stuff. And before I know it, I go from, you know, training no one to like, I'm, bouncers at the strip club coming there i'm writing them programs and stuff so i got kind of thrown in to the wolves with like top dogs in a sense right away how long did it take you to <clears throat> to get with um art labar mm-hmm. and paul leonard from that point yeah. there so i was with a guy named steve hall yeah he started me out and then um he kind of got out of powerlifting and stuff so i went to college at a place called moore park to play football and do track and there's a guy named Chuck Lamantia. You know who that is? Mm-hmm. He just passed, and he was a really good guy. He was he had a I, video magazine, right? Yeah, yeah. He announced all the Venice Beach meets, and um, I knew he'd know the answer. So I said, "Hey, I said, um, who who do I need to get with here in California?" I said, "I'll I'll drive however far I need to. Just let me know." He's like, um, "Here's this guy's no- number, Paul Leonard. Just call him up." So I just cold called him, mm-hmm. and he's like all right, come down. And then I came down and they liked me and there I was. How long of a commute was that for? for how old were you? Okay. So I'm, I'm 18 College. years okay, old, 18, 137 miles each way. Go down there one to two days a week. And, um, I mean, it, it was, like I got so used to that drive. It probably shouldn't have been taking that drive because I was so tired, but it was like, I knew the roads. Yeah. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. And it was, um, I mean, it was worth every second of it because I go down there and we train for two or three hours. And then, um, after I usually stay with Paul would stay after we go walk to this uh, burrito place and get a burrito to eat. And like, 
I picked up a ton of knowledge from like, Paul was real pragmatic in programming, very smart, had like a real good base of knowledge. He also wasn't somebody that was set in his ways. Like if you, if you had like a, if he found out about a good idea, it wasn't like, no, nah, that's, you know, that's bullshit. We've never done it like that. He was real <laughs> open to it. And Art Labar was like really somebody you learned a lot from mentally. That dude is like unshakable. I mean, he come off working construction like 13 hours with no warm up and like pull a deadlift PR kind of just next level. So it was kind of like a really good combination to learn from. You had like the pragmatic, really smart guy put in the work brick by brick. And then the guy is just, you know, fearless and crazy. Was this in a gym or was this in their own private nah. gym or a garage? <laughs> I or? don't think they would have welcomed any Orange County gym. <laughs> <laughs> it was in a private garage. So in Paul Winter's garage. Okay. Then later they moved a lot of it over to a guy named Manny's garage who's over in Costa Mesa. So at that age is around the time you bent six. Yeah. So that was that when you were training with them? Um, I got to no, that was more um when I was training with a guy. Um so Paul had moved away. Um, and so I was training more with a guy named, you know, George Brink is. Yes. Yeah, he was the first guy over fifty to pull eight hundred. So I called him up and I used to just cold call people. That's my trick. I'd see if anything about him. They mm. always like nicer than you think they'd be. So hey, George. Saw you deadlift at eight, you know, seven eighty two or whatever it was before I got to eight hundred. He's like, "Can I come train with you?" He's like, "Only if I can start benching with you." I said, "You got a deal." We trained together. Then my dad actually never was in a powerlift or anything, but he started benching with us and got up to like four fifteen at like fifty four years old. He, I think he's best in college, like three sixty five or something. And we all, me, my dad, George Brink, mainly, and sometimes my brother when he's on, he would train, and we would. Uh, that's kind of how we did that, and then. Um, from there, um, I, I saw I was doing personal training in California. I, I was talking about this earlier on one of the videos we were doing. Just I think my mindset was off. I was convinced somebody like me that was kind of scary couldn't make it like as a trainer in a beach town. Mm -hmm. So from there, I moved to Tennessee and the, with the right mindset just started blowing up. And I had more business I knew to do with it about a month versus like two, two or three years of not enough business so clearly like all in how how i was looking at things was on me so it was you not, yeah 100 percent. like mm. there'd be like a way to there might not be like as many people in like santa barbara that are trying to get ready for football or want to like do whatever but there are plenty of people like rich dudes that want to be trained by one of the strongest guys kind of thing you could definitely yeah. sell that to like you know doctors saying like oh hey this guy trains me kind of thing so there it was there it was on me Went to Tennessee with the opposite, thinking everybody's there to play football. Get strong. Get strong. And before I know it, you know, I have no room in like a month of being there. So you're, when you went through college, did you, when you, when you went in, did you know that exercise science is what you wanted to go into? No, I just wanted to do as little as possible to, to train. So I want, I, I figured <laughs> yeah, at I that point, yeah, at that point in life. <laughs> so my parents were um, both teachers. So I was brought up and I think society was that way more of like, you had to go to college, like, yeah. you know, like, it's funny because teachers, you know, I remember teachers saying like, if you don't go to college, you know, you're going to be flipping burgers kind of, that was like the thing yeah. they used to say. And it's like funny, you go to Waffle House, they're going to sign up says $120,000 for a manager. Oh yeah, I know. <laughs> well, it was more affordable back then too. You for could sure. kind of pay your way through college if you had to. Yeah. I mean, my, my, when I was going through most of my classes, I took at Cal State North, which was like $900 a semester. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> and anyway, so no, I just wanted to train. So I moved down, I moved at one point to Louisiana, took class at LSU to train with Gary Frank. So I was just, honestly, it was not about I figured I could learn a lot more from, um, with an apprenticeship, if you will, yeah. from training with the top lifters than I would from like any kind of exercise science professor. So I said, "The hell with that! I'll get by, do this, and I'm gonna meet the. I'm gonna I'm gonna dedicate my life to training and training with the best people, and that's what I did instead of going to college. You know, I did go. Yeah. I, I did go to college, but like, yeah, didn't take it as seriously at first. Yeah, but your college dictate or your who you wanted to train with dictated where you were going to college, right. which I completely did the same thing. <laughs> so I understand how that kind of all works. At what point in time did that flip for you? Not where the training, where, where the college actually, or the educate, the formal education actually mattered more. Okay. So to be, to be quite frank, I, I don't think it did. I think I knew I had to play a game. So I was talking to Salaria, the owner of ISSA with Fred Hatfield. And we were talking about me doing certification courses and things, and I needed a master's degree. So, I didn't see it as like, this is my next step to get to the next knowledge. I said, okay, here's a game. I can play it. Let's do it. I'll do this. I'll help write these certifications. 
do something I love, earn some cash in the process, blah, blah, blah. Versus yeah. like, this is the way to like, I mean, I, I think I would have been way better off. I saw you had a copy of super training and ready to ship reading those books and talking to people, you know, if it was just a game of knowledge, um, I, and it didn't matter what the paper said, I would have just used that money to like do consultations. Like when like Charlie Francis and people like that, when they're alive and, and do stuff like that, rather than like, I mean, cause a lot of it, I, I think it was good in the sense of like learning how to research things and stuff. Cause I've, mm -hmm. I've used a lot of like having to quote unquote, play the game to write a paper about something you don't really care about, but you have to learn how to correctly cite sources. Yeah. And that kind of stuff, there is some, was some benefit to it. Cause you had to do that for the ISSA work. But if it was just like, honestly, that was the reason I feel figured like, okay, I don't, I don't want to work for somebody else. However, let's just say like some, the NFL or something said, we'll give you $10 million to do whatever. I guarantee you're doing master's degree. So even though that's not my long-term plan and goal, I could have those opportunities if I needed them by having the degree. So that was kind of like the thought process. All right. So I didn't get that much better because that was my thought process going through the whole thing too, was even while I was going through it and I'm in these classes, I'm trying to like <clears throat> find something that they were saying that mm -hmm. I could use for my own training. And there was like nothing ever, you know, no, it's, never. Just like, it's like the fuck is this, you know? So it's, well, <clears throat> I remember one time when I first had to Metroflex, there was a trainer there. And he used to train with Ronnie Coleman. He's a, his name's Eula Say. He used to be a, like a former drill sergeant. And he's like, he kind of almost sort of looked like Ronnie, a smaller Ronnie Coleman. And he was like, you know, 50 some years old, ripped and all this stuff. And he was at a fancy gym. And apparently they like let him go because he didn't have a paper. And he said, motherfucker, I helped build Ronnie <laughs> Coleman. I don't need no piece of paper. Yeah, and I'm yeah. like, dude, like, I mean, this guy's a legend. How do you not like respect this guy? And like, I mean, he'd tell me stuff. I just want to sit there and listen to him. Like, this guy knows so much. He may not have like formal education, but he's built all these like mm -hmm. animals. And so, I mean, I, I guess I'd pick the practical route if I had to pick one, but I, I guess I'm fortunate enough to have done both. Yeah, well, I think even if it is all practical route now, if they're not actually trying to to study the sun. I don't want to say science, right? If, yeah. Because it, but it is. But if they're not trying to actually learn how the body works, mm -hmm. biomechanics and shit like that, then they're doing themselves a disservice. Because the one thing I can say that college did for me is it, it just it raised my bullshit detector just a little bit higher. Sure. You already have one from being in the gym your whole life that this is bullshit. But when it came to um, technical jargon, that bullshit detector was a little bit harder. Cause you really don't know what the fuck they're talking about. Mm -hmm. Cause they're talking above your head so much right. that you don't know. So I just assumed it was all bullshit, right? <laughs> yeah. but, which usually it was. Usually it was. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it kind of raised that bullshit detector where I've, I've now seen when I, when I was still training people and I had to hire trainers, I saw the opposite end of that, you know, people with no practical experience, but high, higher levels of education, you know, a, 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 a CSCS, ACSM, mm -hmm and a master's degree pissed, you know, because they weren't able to get as many clients as person over here that had practical experience and sales experience right. to be able to get the clients and thought it was all fucked up and not fair because they didn't have the education. It's, it's, it's interesting to see. I remember seeing that on that when I was going to do the CSCS test and I did it before I I'd heard it was like way harder than it was. Like it was like, yeah. you know, you need like a, you know, MD, you know, times three kind of thing. <laughs> so I was looking at all these forms to try to find some practice tests. And I remember I sort of, I sent it to Sal, the guy that owned ISSA with Fred. And we were laughing about it because this guy was basically, you know, crying alligator tears on there. Cause he was saying like, it's not what you said. It's yeah. not fair. This guy looks like a bodybuilder and I was CSCS and he's getting more clients, mm -hmm. you know, kind of thing. When I first took it, it was, I think it was at Ball State and I, it was on a TV where you yeah. had to look at the exercises, but then they would ask you like what muscle groups that okay. exercise is trained, but that exercise trained. And it was a, it was a fucking close grip incline. I mean, we're talking, you know, knuckle in on the smooth. Yeah. 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 And I'm looking at this, you know, and so I fucking put triceps, because you know, it's a triceps, yeah. right? And a few times I did. So I fucking failed the um the practical yeah right because it wasn't even practical on the and i remember going back and i was at with louis at the time and oh fuck um 
her name escapes my mind right now, but she was part of the NSCA and she was part of all that. She had a PhD mm. and all this shit at the time. And she's like, how did you fuck that up? And I explained like some of these exercises were like trick sure. exercises. And she's like, no, where you fucked up is you have to answer it the way you think they would want exactly that answered. Right. And I'm, and then I went back, obviously, past it, but it's like, what the fuck is this? I mean, it was it was serious. It was like that. I'm like, who the fuck does it? First off, who does it incline like that? And I didn't realize. Well, I had the same experience because <laughs> when I was before I started my own business, I was strength conditioning uh, coach at a high school. And I taught and to get the, t I got hired like to coach, but like I had to like just hit some, I had to teach a few special ed classes and I'd get the certificate quickly. And so that's what I did is I, I just lost my mindset of what I think was correct and just what does the, the state test want to hear. And the school was wanting me to like tutor other people on how to pass these tests because it, I'm like, I don't think I don't know anything you don't know. I'm just answering it to like, yeah. it's always what in a perfect world you got to think, what would you answer? Well, of course, it's not really a perfect world, but you have to answer the questions that way. Yes, I still say it was a loaded question because the answer is chest, shoulders and triceps. There was no D for all. And oh, I'm wow. like, uh, okay, so I have to pick here. Yeah. You know, that's why that's why I'm thinking this is at first I'm like, okay, this is actually a really yeah. good question because they're asking what's going to be emphasized the most. This might be good. And mm -hmm. then it's just fucking stupid. But anyhow, um, Maria Liggett, that's who it was. She's the one that said, No, you got to go back and just then like it was easy. But was that when was the NSCA? How long have they been around for? Oh god, they've been around since <sighs> man, when I was in high school, so 80s definitely it's probably mid 80s okay the cscs i know for sure i don't know when that actually started but i probably got mine in like 88 89 90 something like that okay you know right around there so it, it was a while and then it was that then it becomes that stupid tedious process where you got to keep the fucking credits and you know go to Sort of see oh yeah. dude that was <laughs> i did go to one of their conferences like that because I, I don't even think i've renewed it the last time but to do that and it actually turned out to be it was like one of those like just circle jerk just come on and like it turned out to be this guy spoke about cluster sets that was brilliant so it was like it made the whole thing mm -hmm. a guy named jonathan oliver from tcu made the whole thing worthwhile mm -hmm. But yeah, because every once in a while there's a diamond in the rough of those conferences, but some of it's just, I mean, so basic. Yeah, a lot of them felt like um, college. Mm -hmm. You know, like a professor giving their presentation and you're just like, oh, God, can I? You're just looking around for anybody that's jacked that you can talk to in the hallway. Yeah. Because that's where you would figure something I've out. I've been to another one that was sort of an extreme the other way where they were having people do um, like actually like, so I've been to like all talking or all practical. The all practical one, it was in Denver, and they were having people that ha I mean, this was like I was not in good cardio shape at the time. Like, I hadn't been doing all the stuff I've been doing now or anything. And I remember they took everybody outside because it was higher altitude. And like, they're just having people like dynamic warm up. Like, I'm talking like, you know, <laughs> high knees, five, 10 yards. I, mean, I literally thought I was going to have to give like CPR out there. It, it was crazy. And like, it was either like, we either do like, people trying to do cleans and stuff that didn't know what they're doing. And it's just a total circus or it was like, just like just talking of like, I think me and like two other people could like actually relate on the level and like 30 people just staring. So, yeah, I went through something. Like that. I'm <laughs> laughing because I went through something like that where <laughs> at the peak of my powerlifting career, I'm also a trainer yeah. and the club I'm at is sending me to these different conferences and they sent me to this, it was called an SAQ conference. I didn't know what the fuck it meant at the time. It's yeah. speed, agility, agility quickness. Yeah, yeah. And so I go to this conference and there's like agility ladders and hurdles and all this other kind of shit. And it was all practical. <laughs> and uh, that was a front. So that Friday I squatted, jacked my back up, you know, kind of bad mm -hmm. where it's like, oh, fuck, this is not going to be good. Then I had to go learn how to do A skips, B skips, C skips at 305 pounds oh, yeah, and dude. all all this ladder shit and all this other stuff. And there's no way I wasn't going to not do it yeah right but i'm getting smoked obviously by mm -hmm. everybody but my takeaway from the whole thing is my back felt great the next day so i'm like okay if i jack my back up i don't need to do this but i have to do something for sure and i made some i made some pretty decent connections while i was there and it was a whole different world i was working with lacrosse players no not lacrosse um squash 
because it was a squash club I was at. So I'm mm-hmm. like, okay, I can use some of this shit. Some of this shit, I don't know. It was a whole nother world, by the way. I'm like, I don't even know what this shit is, you know, from that. But the same type of experience. So I'm like, I am not, I'm not made for this. Right. But it didn't change my mind because I just went back to powerlifting to where I know I wasn't actually made for that anyhow. And none of it was going to, none of it was going to benefit me at my mindset at that time. For sure. Now, looking back, probably being a little bit better cardiovascular shape would have made a big difference <laughs> compared to well, I was shocked at how out of shape people were, though, that didn't look like they would be because I wasn't doing like any cardio at the time. I'm talking like the cardio was yeah. like, you know, maybe like some sled drags or something. And that was about it. And I felt like I was upper half of the tier. <laughs> oh, yeah. So you're hanging on and everybody else. Yeah. Oh, that's even worse. Yeah. It, yeah. It, but it was at alti- I don't know if it's yeah. altitude or what it was, but it, it was pretty strange. There was there was one topic on here that you listed. It was one of the last ones that came in a little bit mm-hmm. later that I want to kind of jump off sure. with this on is uh, Christian Thibodeau and I were speaking about the difference between enhanced and mm-hmm. uh, non-enhanced lifters and right. training. And it was a, kind of a weird conversation to navigate a little bit because I, I'm coming more from like a strength side. I think he was coming more from this hypertrophy side. It was probably one of the smartest discussions I've heard. Yeah, about. That's, yeah. I really liked it. And you had some insight to chime I in think on. You, first off, I liked what you guys were going with it because I've always, um, another guy, his name's uh, Patrick Brennan. We we're talking about it at Destination Dallas one time about it. Like a lot of people think it helps. So like in layman's terms, like it say it helps your recovery. So for example, if you're, Let's go, you're squatting 500 for five sets of five and you get on the juice. So then you start, you keep squatting 500 for five sets of five. You will recover 10 times better from that. It's going to be, you're just going to be easier. You're going to, no problems, right? You get somebody, but why would somebody do that? I mean, if you're going to put in the turbo fuel, you need to go out in the super highway. You don't need to be mm-hmm. like driving around the parking lot. So you should be hitting it harder then. So then you don't recover better because you are you become more neurologically efficient. So people think it's just a strength thing. It's a speed thing. It's an efficiency thing. It's it's you're more agile, like uh, to a degree, like I think like when they're saying no, it doesn't help Mark McGuire swing the bat. That's not true. It does. Because you're more neurally efficient. So you can actually do a lot of those movement patterns, even more efficiently. So the problem is when you get more neurally efficient, it's going to be harder to recover from because your tissue is like so dialed in mm-hmm. that it becomes harder to recover from. So I absolutely think you recover better if you're going to stick on the same routine and not try to push the, the pedal of the metal. Of course, you're going to recover better. But why would you take that risk if you're not going to really push it? I mean, because I mean, it's not a benign thing. I mean, it's one thing if, you know, somebody's deficient in a hormone, they're just getting to a normal level. It's a whole different thing than somebody yeah. like, really want to push it so if you're really going to push it you're going to push it and then you're not recovering as well so I, that's what you say like like you look at like i think intuitively some of the ipf programs and stuff have like kind of figured it out where they're doing like a lot more frequency and things like that and i don't know if it's like it was like somebody like made that call out or if they kind of just like the evidence pointed that direction and get that way but i think that's why they're able to do that because if you would have said say 20 years ago well you can just squat and bench more often and off the juice and on it, people, you know, thought you're nuts. But I think there, there's actually something to that because when you get on it, you become, you see people become more efficient. So I've coached primarily people that don't do it, but I've coached people that obviously do do it. Then I've seen people that didn't do it, then do it. So I've seen kind of like all three of those. And it's just, I don't just see with people the recovery, like just going through the roof. What I've often wondered is the way that I could tell if when I was on was working right was how uh, say a box squat would feel when i would come off the box there was a certain feeling where it was like uh, there was a supposed thump, yeah. right like it was a, uh-huh. it was different and it's like okay or how the bench would feel coming out of the bottom and that was like oh but then at, at the same point it's like now this is more fucking exhausting right because it's it's like a level five to a level 10 but i often wondered if what if that force production I was putting in it wasn't that, you know, say instead of a five, it might've even been controlled at like a seven. Mm -hmm. Then is the recovery easier? There'd be some, I think there'd be some sort of like line you could teeter where you could make it that way. And I don't think anybody knows exactly where that is, but there'd have to be something like that where for sure. Yeah. I just don't know how you would, you'd have to be very mentally strong 
mm. because now you're going to have to control that shit, you know, because there, there's an aggression part that kind of leads to that, you know, as well. But kind of going back for, for a long time, I kept saying that, you know, the, the more gas somebody gets and the bigger they get, yeah. the less they need to do. And right. the same size person that's drug free needs to do more. Because you think about it, like, is it, is it making your heart rate go down? Is it making your blood pressure go down? Of course it's not if you're doing a bunch. It's the opposite is going to happen. So you're not going to be recovering as well. I mean, you're just in a more uh, sympathetic dominant state just walking around. Yeah. <laughs> so how, how would you be recovering better? I mean, unless you're just taking it pretty easy or like doing maintenance stuff. It also became a way later on that I, if somebody was to tell me they were drug free, I could, I would know if I, uh, it was one way I would know if they were bullshitting me or not. Cause I could tell based upon the workload that they were actually doing. Yeah. Right. Cause it would be, I mean, it would be higher workload. There's more sets, you know, there's more stuff in there. No way in hell the other guy was going to be able to do that. But looking back now, I wonder if that other guy didn't let his cardiovascular base go completely to hell mm -hmm. if some of that could have been higher some of the workload could, could have, have been be. higher but now would it be necessary you see what i'm saying because the rubber the recovery might have been better but just having the added work would that actually have any pot more have like benefit? An adaptation threshold yeah, of yeah. like would it actually like do any yeah because you want like basically a lot of times you have to do high volume but you're not just doing it for the sake of doing it it's like it's high maybe but it's still the minimal you can get to get the maximal it just might be higher than people are already doing the whole point shouldn't be doing volume for the sake of volume you should be doing you know as little as you can do to maximize it however a lot of people are doing so little it seems like a lot maybe yes it can happen like that i think yeah you make a good point there and i think you have to be onto something and and it's like goes back to what we kind of talked before we started recording uh, i think we can jump into the part about when you get more advanced period whether you're on or not on you you generally do less so a lot of sports you're going to look at the training volume and it's going to continually go up it to the more elite levels you get where this is opposite. I think because like, the, so there's like, you know, we call it smart lifts and dumb lifts. If we want to call it that way, you have like a snatch or something. It's really complex lift. It's like, um, gymnastics with barbell in your hand. I think Louie or Mel Siff or somebody had, had made that reference. I think it's dead on where then you get like a conventional deadlift. Like you get some random dude off the farm out there, come do like 600 for reps. First time trying it, not a lot of skill to it. So, you, these lower skilled movements you've been doing your whole life you don't need to keep doing like endless volume on them i mean it it, it would be less over time and, and then you and you, plus you're more nearly efficient even if it you know so then i think people get like as you that power thing's different it's not like other sports like you get further along the less you do and it still might be more than a lot of people but it you know if you're you were here now you're here you know you don't need to keep doing more volume for sure. that becomes um comes a tricky thing because what they needed when they first started is the opposite of what they need when they're at the top, mm -hmm. almost in every regard where <clears throat> what I've seen actually more times than not is with, well, first, if, if, if I'm speaking volume, I, I talk just sets times reps, that's volume workload sure. would be sets times reps times weight. Okay. So workload, I think is what we're really talking about. If somebody sure. gets stronger, the workload gets a little workload's bit higher. Yep. Um, <clears throat> But what I've seen more times than not is a lifter, as they peak for a meet, you know, they, they drop, right? Because that's part of the peaking. As they drop that, then bam, Shoot they're stronger. There, yeah. Well, they'll start playing around with decreasing their workload and volume. I guess both kind of play into each other earlier in the cycles. But then they see that they have, they're lifting more weight. So then they, their, their minimum effective dose gets skewed. And it ends up becoming very low. And then over a period of time, it stays very, very low. And then they end up getting hurt because they don't have work capacity for shit. You, you but, see what I'm but saying? But that's when they push it a little bit in that regard in the off, in the off season after the meet, though. Yes. It would be a time to do stuff like that. It should be more, you know, sub-maximal type of work. Yes. If they're intelligent. If they're intelligent. Or do like you just talk about like doing some bodybuilding stuff, you know, like that's, that's a different ball game, though, because like that sort of like volume or workload what you want to call it it's not the same i mean because i you've done both oh yes i've done both and it's a different feeling because like to me powerlifting is more mentally draining like yes. the training because i need to hit this number 
So like, I don't want to walk across Walmart if I need something. I'm just you know, not going to get it. I'm going to go back to the car and rest kind of thing where bodybuilding, you like feel better. You're like, mm-hmm. you, you know, it's like yeah. short breaks and it's like, oh man, I feel great. Mm-hmm. And like the workouts aren't stressful. I guess the only stressful part would be the dieting type of thing would be the more stressful part. But see, when I did it, I didn't have like kids or anything. So it wasn't stressful to me. Mm-hmm. It was just like a Spartan lifestyle all alone. And, but the, the, the training was a lot more stressful for powerlifting. It's not necessarily harder. It's like harder in your central nervous system. Like you feel kind of crappy the next day after a big lift and stuff sometimes, but like bodybuilding, more power building type of training, I always felt like really good. Like, mm-hmm. and I think that's when you can get, you know, you can kind of like rejuvenate yourself as a powerlifter if you hit phases within your scheme at some point of that. Of course, of course. And I think that the, <clears throat> With the high end that we're talking about, because a lot of these questions that people have is, you know, how do you train these high end athletes? And it's a good conversation. We'll we'll have the conversation. So we'll have this conversation, but they need to understand they're not that high end athlete. Because if they get up to being somebody that's breaking all time world records and you're talking 900 pounds on their back or 700 or 600 pounds in their hand, they can't do that shit every week. No. You know, there's there's more things being impacted from a mental standpoint, a joint stand pack. And these intermediates would see that and say, well, maybe I just need to bench twice a week. And they bench 275, yeah. you know, or something like that. And they're trying to emulate what this is, but they haven't built that. I don't even know how you would explain that because it's not a work capacity, right? You know, it's just the weight's so fucking heavy at that point. Well, I mean, there's studies that show that, like, you, like for example, if you get the more you squat, the longer your rest intervals need to be. So, like, if you're you squat say a thousand, I squat five hundred, we're both doing reps at sixty percent. You need a lot longer break. It doesn't matter. We could have the same VO two max, same resting heart rate, all that crap, whatever. But like, you just need longer when you're stronger. That's mm-hmm. it's a, it, anecdotes would surely show that, and so would you know any and so of studies. I mean, that's pretty much agreed upon the with a lot of the top lifters that you work with Mm -hmm. you're gonna at some point you're gonna have to have a conversation where you're gonna have to dial back their frequency right i assume because they're working with you they're going to be compliant right right? has there ever been pushback i know i can't do that i'll get weak usually that's going to be the lower end yeah it's usually gonna be not not so much because i think usually um if we get to that point where we were having these conversations often, there'd be like a trust and they know also that I'd listen to what they have to say and their concerns and, and that kind of thing. And I, 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 there hasn't been much pushback on that kind of thing because I think a big part of getting results is um, ob- besides like the adherence is like actually buying into what you're doing. Because like I said before, California didn't do anything as a personal trainer go to Nashville and there was no new certification, no new nothing. Didn't know anybody but my uncle and about two or three other people there and killed it. So that was all in just like in my mindset. So I think a lot of that comes down to also like trusting the process. If you don't, you're probably going to, you know, you're certainly not going to optimize your results. How compliant are they? I mean, the the peaking cycle is the peaking cycle, right? It's not your, what you're doing is probably no different than what anybody else is doing except probably the frequency being spread out for the recovery. Yeah. Am I safe on saying that? I, I wouldn't say no different, but I, I think we're not too, I think no, it's not like some outer space where you look at it and be like, <laughs> you know, for sure. Well, it, well, okay. The assessments of where they're weak and shit right, like that, of course, stuff yes. like that. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> when they get into post meat, how compliant are they with that? Cause now that's the flip to something that they're probably not comfortable or not going to like doing hypertrophy work stuff like that i think a lot of people like it though. from my understanding is once they do it they like it because they feel better and it's just something different so like if if you're bo- so if, for one i think most people will actually enjoy it for two if you're buying into the process it's not like going to disneyland which is fun it's actually going to benefit you too so pretty compliant with it i mean once in a while you know, so I'm like off script, like, Hey, I felt really great today. And like, it's funny. Cause he's, you know, I don't want them to do this, but like say every once in a while, like, Oh, I want to see where I was at. And there'd be a lot, they'll be surprised at how strong they've gotten just by kind of, you know, resting from the real heavy weight. Yeah. And it's like, okay, well, I'm, I don't want you to do that, but I'm kind of glad you did in a sense, just so you can see that it's actually working kind of thing. What I see more of is, I don't know if I see more of it, but the, 
like this whole prep thing. Mm -hmm. I, Ten years ago, nobody talked about like a prep, right? Prep, yeah. It was just every, it was just you're a power lifter, yeah. you weren't. There was no prep, so it took me a while to understand what that meant. But what I see more of is they're they're in prep, and then when they're not in prep, they're they're not working with the coach anymore. You know, they they don't go to the same places to train that they used to, which I personally feel is completely fucking ass backwards well i'd rather prep them in the off season so that's <laughs> yes if like someone was thinking about working with me or something and you have a choice i would definitely rather do the off season because like you said the peaking to me if it's done right we've laid the foundation so as long as you don't act like a jackass we should be able to get something mm -hmm. good out of this where the the real gains are going to be made doing these off season type of phases for sure and so mo like all the people I've had that done the best are doing it in the off season too. And if they had to go off, like choose, I would rather have them off during the prep. Elaborate more because I know this happens a lot with this because they only really want to train the 12 weeks prep, right? Mm -hmm. And we're on the same page here. To okay. me, the 12 weeks prep is there's, you're going to clean up some technique. You're getting a little bit stronger. Maybe you're going to add drugs, right? They're, yeah. they're, this, a little more specificity. There's, so. Yeah, more specificity. But this off-season point is where you're actually going to make the biggest differences. You're going to work on your weak points. Yes. I mean, sometimes if you're more – because, like, I heard you talking about the other day saying, like, you know, when someone gets real advanced, it's not like you're making major technique. Like, oh, you got to do this, this, and this all yeah. the time. It's more going to be like you're supporting them, figuring out their – help them figure out their weaknesses, prescribe to that, and that kind of stuff. Where the off season, quote unquote, for a beginner could be more of like, hey, you know what? We're going to do, you know, instead of, you know, we're going to do like little short rest breaks, more sets, a little more, you know, more total workload and get, get your density up and, and use that as a chance to hone your technique. Where for an advanced lifter, a lot of, t you know, they're going to need more of a break a lot of times from like the big three. I might go through a phase of even like, I mean, I, I think you've done this before too, if I don't, if I recall, of doing like, no barbell in the hand yeah, for a while yeah. just you know sled drags and then like maybe by the end of it the only axial loading will be like a, a fairly light farmer's walk where you know it's more for density than like any kind of heavy weight and so we get a huge benefit out of that so i think if we can set you up like that get you those weaknesses taken care of build your work capacity because the work capacity is not just to like a, it's not anything special it's what it is is it's going to allow you to train properly so we don't have to worry about a bunch of recovery and this kind of stuff because you're ready to go like yeah. we've already taken care of this so we can focus on because like what we we're talking about you want the you know the minimal effect minimal effective dose that gets the not the effective dose but the minimal effective dose that maximizes results okay but if you're not in condition for powerlifting or whatever you're trying to do that can be a problem because we can't train properly. So like, oh, dude, I'm like laid up. I can't, you know, do anything for the next five days or something. That's that's not a good place to be in. So if we can kind of get you ready to go from there, then, then we're in a good spot. Yeah, what I would all suggest if it's advanced. Now, what I suggest and what they do is always different mm -hmm. things. I mean, you know kind of how that works is if if it's top, top tier, no bars in their hands or no bars yeah. on their back, right? So that's the spinal compression and the shoulder compression. And then no sets under 10. And I will look at the repetitions per training session based upon what the average was if I was to count the last four weeks, including the week after the meet. Mm -hmm. So say the week after the meet, there might be nothing. And then the week of the meet, there's not really a whole lot of reps. Right. There might be 25 30 total reps in the meet yeah and then that week before that you're starting you're at the end of a peak so just to throw a number out there without calculating you might only have a total of 150 reps over a four-week period of time so i don't want that first training session back to be 300 reps that's 300 percent more volume mm -hmm. than what they had in the past month so let's start at 50 reps per session 75 and it's it's really that fucking simple it's like no bars in your hands, no bars in your back. 75 total reps. I don't care how you get them done. No sets under 10. Do whatever the fuck you want. There you go. <laughs> right? It's, yeah. And then you just build up from there. And you usually at about 50% compliance on time. So if I say eight weeks, I'll get four. Right. You know, and even with a beginner. A lot can happen to four, though. You can feel a lot better. Oh, of course. Of course. And even if it's a complete beginner, when I know they don't need it. I mean, if they're 18, they don't, they don't need it but it's a habit they should learn for sure. So if it's two weeks, then it goes out there as at least as part of that whole thing. And then it's that transition because sometimes they don't realize they're going to get weaker. 
you know, which blows yeah. my mind. You know, if you peak for something, obviously you're going to be able to get weaker from there and then build up. When <clears throat> I've seen some of your, well, I've seen your programs well, in your book. Let go me go, ahead, go ahead. Yeah, so yeah. also I think something you think about too is with this kind of training we're talking about, like we get the more bodybuilding phases, you're going to gain muscle because you get the opposite happen too is like, you know, for example, Johnny Jackson and I worked together in 2012 for the Raw Unity meet. And he was supposed to weigh in at 242, he claimed, and he hadn't been weighing himself. I'm just kind of like, I'm going to take a break from like really tracking mm -hmm. my nutrition. I'm like, you don't look that light, but okay, whatever. And went to the meet and he's like, I'm like, he's all probably weighed 235. We weighed 264. And we're doing way less volume. You can go go on YouTube. All the videos are up there mm -hmm. from the training. I mean, I guess it was pretty high volume for for because he had a good work capacity and he had been deadlifting where he dialed in, but um honestly if I, it went really well but i'd probably do less now even if i went back but he gained something like 30 pounds by just transitioning his training because it was like a new stimulus where the opposite happens for a lot of power things you're doing so little it's heavy but you're not doing like you just said what 25 reps in a month or whatever it was. yeah yeah <laughs> and yeah. then all of a sudden you know you're, you're bench pressing you know six sets of five reps you miss resting two minutes between or something and like you know or you're doing like dumbbell work or something you hadn't been doing or even body weight training if you're big, sure, and you gain a bunch of muscle and stuff. And, the, and you know the best, the the mo the proven way to increase strength potential is muscle mass, and especially when it's like a, you know, a dumber lift like a power lift that's not as neurally demanding as like an Olympic lift. Adding muscle helps. Like you want to get stronger, gain. Like it's my first powerlifting mentor said, Steve, like, you want to get stronger, gain weight. You know, drink gallon. He say drink a gallon of milk a day and gain weight, and you get stronger. I mean, so if you just want your numbers to get up, you just get bigger. Mm -hmm. And I think like people, you know, don't sometimes look at the hypertrophy. I think we have people that some people obsess on it and some people don't think it's important. It is, it's, it is important. I mean, for sure. And then I think that's another benefit of that. And it's actually going to, when you put on that size, you're going to feel better doing it. But listen. no, I, I totally believe so because it's, it's and when things are phasic in nature, you're going to have a certain phase you, that you'll become desensitized to that. Then when you add it back in, you're going to make all the progress. bodybuilders I've worked with that want to go to powerlifting for a while, gain weight when that's not the objective. Usually they get bigger because they're not used to training this way. Cause we're doing like more powerlifting. It's not like, it's not like this is like power building. where like, this is the whole goal is to gain size. This is like, no, you, you know, like, you know, Joe Mackey, I want to go you know, run to 800 deadlift, got up to nine ten. you know, it, over the course of a year, it's like, no, we're training more this way now. So you're doing quite a bit less volume um on you know and but you've you've gained so much size because you're you you were training proper now for powerlifting mm -hmm. where if i take you and you're only training powerlifting, hey let's just like do a, a bro split bodybuilding you're probably gonna gain size for that because you it's a totally new you know you're, you're totally new stimulus well, that's that's that's, <laughs> that's funny because it's, it's two extremes but it, it that and that's why i think that the hit training comes and goes with high volume training like high volume training will stay popular yeah. for a long period of time. Right. And then, shh, I mean, like hits kind of making its way back now and then people are going to do real well on it because they've been doing high volume yeah. shit for a decade. Exactly. <laughs> so then they do this and it's like, Oh my God, this is a miracle thing. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, slowly that fades off. And then if they would just realize you can, you can structure this shit. Yeah, if you yeah. want to get big and strong, you can just go alternate phases of like strength and quote unquote hypertrophy and go quite a long time like that and get a lot of, you know, the best of both worlds and, and, and progress in both. It's not like you're necessarily even making one the sacrificial ring It's fa phasic in nature. Yes. Just how well you can plan the phases, but starting off, you know, if you're an intermediate lifter, it doesn't have to be like rocket scientists down to a point. You just, you know, switch phases. I mean, with where I was going to go was the programs that I've seen that you've written, mm. you know, for our site, other sites yep. and, 20 fucking books that some that i got to see before anybody else did which is yeah. the, the bench press science one stuff like that is so i can't sit here and say here's your program thank god by the way i'm glad you're that way yeah. right because there is no i don't want to have a program because yes we you and i talked about this not on a podcast <laughs> or anything but a while ago I, I think it was when we were at the old site um and we were talking about how people get pigeonholed into if you attach your name to something like if Arthur Jones is alive, I doubt he could be like selling German volume yeah. training. It's like you're the the hit guy, you know what I mean? So like, or you're the heavy duty guy, whatever you are or whoever you are, if you become that guy, and I don't think I know everything, 
so I've, you know, we'll change some. And um, I was saying, you know, Anthony Schlegel, mm -hmm. but we were working out together last time. We we're kind of talking about some of the things we've changed our mind on a little bit, like sprinting wise and stuff that's more for athletes. And last night, and it's just like, I, there has to be an adaptive process. There's different people and you're going to learn things along the way. So I never wanted to be like, for example, I've got a few different nutrition books. I know people get good results with keto. I know mm -hmm. people get good results with like counting their macros and things like that. There's all fasting, you know, not necessarily for bodybuilding, gaining muscle, but just to lose fat, especially the fatter you are. But like, yeah, at the end of the day, we're just trying to control the calories. Mm -hmm. And like, but like, it's to like somebody that's not used to bodybuilding diet. If you say, Hey, this, you're on keto, here's your list. You can eat all these things. So, like a truck driver or something, okay, good. We get like some, you know, Duke smoked sausage at a truck stop or something and eat that. That's easy to convey to them and they'll get, they're going to get results from it. So, like, no, are they going to win the Olympia that way? No, probably not. But like, there's different ways to do things. Yeah. And I, I have no problem admitting there's effective ways. Like, you just said that. I, I remember doing all the high bodybuilding, volume bodybuilding training, doing a phase of like more hit training on a hammer strength incline, like just one rest pause set. But I pushed that set so hard. It was like, even though I've been all this volume, it's like I was sore for, you know, for a week from that. Yeah. And it's like, you, you can go the opposite way too, where you're just training real, I've done like all heavy singles, then do a bunch of sub maximal work in squats where I'm only doing heavy singles. It's like, okay, like I'm at 60% of the weight, but I, I mean, this is killing me kind of thing. Yeah. So, I mean, you can go either way with it. Well, it's really hard to say that there's just one best way if you've been around for a while. It's phasic. Because you've seen so many different ones. Now, you can say, you know, I'm biased towards this. For sure. Which we all are going to be. But that bias bends and twists based upon who you're working with because the ultimate objective is can you make that person better? Well, I always look like this. Okay, if I'm strength coaching people, let's just take us to MMA. I'm an MMA fighter, but I'm a strength coach. So my, like... In MMA, your bat, your main thing might be jiu-jitsu or tie boxing or something. That's then you branch off from there. Okay, so I do all these different things, but like my nucleus is powerlifting, and everything kind of branches sure. off from there. Yes, kind of thing where you know I think that's the way to do it for people is you want to get like learn something really well and then kind of branch off from that. That's I don't think point. everybody needs to do big three. I think I remember I first got a personal trainer. This guy from Canada was telling me he trains everybody like a powerlifter. I'm like, this sounds insane. What he's saying, and, you know, like you know, old ladies doing, you know, three sets of three on squat and resting six minutes and they're doing the bar kind of thing, just craziness. But I do think we can all kind of build off something. So like, you know, I always say strength is your base. Powerlifting is my base. How I learned it. And like, I might do a program for a tactical athlete or something. And there's not a normal squat in the whole program, but I still come back to powerlifting is kind of like my base and branch off of it. Yeah. Well, it also provides <clears throat> solid metrics mm -hmm. for tracking when <laughs> I would consult with strength and conditioning coaches i was trying to figure out what their squat and bench and deadlift was not personally mm -hmm. but with their athletes on the field you know we know in powerlifting that here's the squat bench and deadlift and then we know these movements here help drive those movements right all right so what are those movements that mm -hmm. carry over to the field what has the dynamic correspondence for them mm -hmm. with their athletes is it a fucking vertical is it a 40 like what is it and then usually if you speak to them enough and ask the right questions, they'll give you three or four things. Might be a clean front squat, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Like there's what you're talking about. There, there's your bias. There's your bias. Right. Right. Those are the metrics because obviously they're in there and they work for all your athletes because A, you know how to coach that lift mm -hmm. very good. Yeah, for sure. You know how to physically structure that lift very good. So you can tell if they're getting stronger or if they're not. Mm -hmm. Then the rest of it is where's their skill set? Is that on you or is that on the skill coach? You know, and kind of For bridge sure. that. But <clears throat> with your volume on the programs that I've seen mm -hmm. on the front end, first training block right. leading into it leans a little bit higher than what others will be. Right. So instead of the standard two sets of five or whatever it is, you might have four sets mm -hmm. or so. Um, how did you come to that conclusion over? the decades that you've been doing this because it is that's one thing that does make you a little bit more unique right um i because i i think i get um basically um what kind of all started it is ed Cohn helped um me with a deadlift program and it was it was structured that way where we did a ton of volume up front i think he designed it with uh mark Philippi, mm -hmm. and um i think it's that internet the routines all over the internet now so he gave it to me 
And then I kind of kept tweaking it and stuff like on myself and then experiment other people. And I got really good results. Like if we kind of really like did a period of concentrated loading, take a like a deload or reload week as I call it, and then kind of reset and then go to more like standardized or lower volume. So I got a ton out of that initial phase, like dialing in like the technique of the lift and stuff. But I don't think like I've said earlier, it's such a complex sport where that needs to be year round necessarily. It's just that upfront phase. Mm-hmm. And then kind of that's is like you you accumulate all this volume then then you kind of get it more normalized where like the motor pattern should feel dialed in the work capacity is dialed in and um you know so if like i've been working with someone a real long time there may not always be that much you know because a book a lot of times someone's pick that up and do that program so we, you know they i'm kind of also condensing a lot into there because i'm not working with them all the time where yeah. if i was working with them all the time it wouldn't be so top and heavy because we're taking care of a lot of that stuff because you got to go to where the audience is because like you know you you know you you don't always know where their starting point's going to be so I, I think it's important to get these kind of work capacity phases into a degree but if i've been working with them all the time it wouldn't necessarily be that that much. makes sense and it's also i think over the years i've sort of i'd say like toned it back a little bit it's weird though, because I have and got better results with it, but I got good results with that. So I think there's a lot of it also with the buy in and then not doing like, even though a lot of there's a lot of volume, a lot of it's sub maximal volume. So a lot of it's like, like compensatory acceleration work, you know, or speed training, as you say, but at a higher percentage, like say a West Side would do it. Mm-hmm. But it's not, not high enough where, like, if you're doing, like, say, for example, you know, six sets of triples of deadlift at like 65% or something. It's not like you're at ninety percent, but you got that one higher end set kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So I think that that's what it is too. Is like we're getting like cause I, I've toned it back a little bit. Also, I'm not working with the people all the time, so if I am, it's generally not that gonna be that high, that close. But I think people do need that, so I'm working it in there because, with like a book program, say, it's an, you're trying to make it as eff- you, you want to do your best to make it as effective as possible. So we look at like a standard deviation. What is it, like like sixty eight percent is one standard deviation. Yeah. Okay, so we can look at that percent and try to, okay, this works most of the time, so let's throw this in here and make it as best as we can for a majority of the people. Now, if you're not in that majority. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, no, I get it. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that's how you got to do that. So it's like different than like, you know, because I always say like my specialty is like working with individuals, but what I do is compile the information from those individuals and try to collectively share it so that we get results from like the programs I put out, the books I put out. Cause it's actually coming from working with people and it generally does work. It's just, if you're outside of that norm, it, that's when you get a little tricky. Yeah. Well, that's any program that goes but, out there. I mean, you look at like, just like you're talking about frequency earlier. I mean, there's been people, what to big Jim Williams is benching twice a day. Mm-hmm. Okay. Julius is every nine to 10 days, like real heavy Jeremy Hornstra for like a real top end guy. He was one of the more normal ones of like a heavier bench day then a lighter, either more tricep and shoulder focused bench day or speed kind of bench day, depending where we were in or dumbbell day, depending on where it was in the phase. But that was like more normal of like that one standard deviation with a lot of these guys that are like freaks. They, they, it's going to be a little bit different. So like, I mean, I don't know how the hell Jim Williams is benching twice a day. I mean, that would kill me. But I mean, who knows? Maybe would have benched 900 wrong. <laughs> no, I don't know. I know. I, I don't know. We because don't know. that weight, you know, I'm saying you still, that systemic fatigue yeah. becomes larger and larger with the weight as well. I mean, because I've known, I've done like experiments on my, this is different because it's, um, have you done those higher frequency like squat programs? Or, I've done that like, yeah. I've done it like just kind of screwing around when I've been squatting really and get back into squatting. And it's amazing how quick with those periods. So that's another thing is like those periods of like concentrated loading it's amazing how fast you can accelerate your progress. So if like someone said, all right, you have six weeks to, you know, to, to live to, or you got to squat a certain amount of weight or, or you're going to get killed or something. So mm-hmm. I would do a very high, if it's all only one lift, like squat, I would do a really high frequency program. But I don't think the problem is you like when I've done that and it worked well, I felt like shit all the time. But if it's life or death, fine, who cares? Mm-hmm. The other problem is the other lift sucked. So it's like, okay, I, I I don't feel good squatting. I'm kind of sore in the groin, like quads, all that. But when I do it, it actually looks really good and like it moves well. So cool. But then like, I feel like ass, my deadlift's horrible. Everything like functional is horrible, but I'm squatting really good. Mm-hmm. So is 
if you were a squat specialist, that's cool. But like, it, it wasn't for me. So I think there's all these different metrics. You have to look at the frequency. And like, I think like that's one of the biggest individual differences I've found is also categorizing people. We got this from Fred Hatfield. Was he talk? We talked a lot in our conversation. A common a couple common themes were one was he always thought the difference between, and I agree with this, the difference between like the strongest lifters and the weakest lifters, besides like the lifestyle or mindset of like you know physical attributes, he said was compensatory acceleration training. He said the stronger guys, they get it. So either someone's taught them, they've applied it, or they have intuitively applied it. Like I don't like my first powerlifting mentor, Steve Hall. He wasn't really like. Um, I mean, he's a really smart guy to degree in philosophy, but he's not like a real science based guy. But I mean, everything's about speed. Like Gary Frank, the only word we didn't, I don't think we ever really discussed technique. I just heard speed, 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 speed all the time. Same with like Paul Leonard, Art Labar, all these guys. It was like, that's the only thing I heard was speed. And I just noticed by like learning to ex myself, learning to explode, having that intention. Whether it moved the bar moved faster or not, the intention was there. That's what kind of took me to the next level when I kind of got that. And that's what Fred always said is the best lifters understand this somehow. Someone's taught them they just get it. And then the other one was um, we talked a lot about easy gainers and slow gainers. And we would often talk about how it looked like, you know, if you look, you remember like the hard gainer magazines and all mm -hmm. this? Okay, so their thing was, well, like, if if you're a hard gainer you train less remember that you train mm -hmm, less mm -hmm. you do less volume and all that stuff if you know you're a hard gainer you can only like you know train every 10 days for like one set kind of thing where we found like the the exact opposite to be true the harder gainer somebody is the more often they need to train the more volume they can do the more intensity they can handle more frequently because they're just not neurologically efficient enough that to do sense. damage where so they need to do a ton like it's like if you're not ready to go to medical school because you just don't get it you're not going to study less you got to study more and more and like revolve your life around it so the good news is if you're a hard gainer you can do more where if an easy gainer someone just walks by the weight room and grows they have to do less and that's a real so the generally what we found was the better somebody is at reps assuming their technique and everything's off the more of a, a hard gainer they are so like the hard gainer, you put 80% of their max on the bench, go hit it for max reps or like 20 reps, 15 reps. Easy gainer could be like six five or less. And like, so Fred did a, an experiment where he te tested these rep maxes on various lifts and was finding anywhere from like, you know, three reps to like 20 plus reps. And it seemed like the people that could do more reps at 80% of their max were harder gain. So like, how do you, you know, how do you figure this out with somebody? It's pretty easy. You just look at like, all right, give them an like they're on accessory movement on your trice. You're doing dumbbell tricep extensions, so, you know, go 12, 12 max reps or something. They get like 28 reps when you think they're only at 14. You know, the person's probably a hard gainer. You kind of like look at their training and then kind of program that direction where they do more, they do more and more frequently. Cause a lot of times, once I'm, I'm pretty certain someone's a hard gainer, I can start doing more frequency and things like that. And then all of a sudden, it just really expedites their gains. That makes sense. <clears throat> Cause what I what I would saw, mm -hmm. I don't see it so much anymore, but what I would see with that was usually the hard gainers didn't have the experience. They didn't have the same experience as somebody that's been around for a long time. Mm -hmm. So they weren't fucking around when they were a teenager training arms every day. For sure. You know, and all this other stuff. So they didn't have this mind muscle connection. So I kind of looked at it as they don't know how to train the muscle. They only know how to train a movement. Some Sometimes athletes are that way because they just do sport training, mm -hmm. you know, so they don't get that. And then once you kind of learned how to train that muscle, then it becomes a different game, right? That makes sense. You can get, you can exhaust that muscle a little bit more Then over a longer period of time. You're kind of subconsciously doing that with even not with, without the intent. But then when you put the intent on, you can actually fatigue it way faster. That's interesting said, because I've noticed that with some of the hard, people that are hard gainers is, they, their lap pull downs, like for example, their biceps are always gonna be. If you do high reps, it's my biceps are killing me. And yeah, we're like a easy gainer. You can do. I mean, I think I'm more of an easy gainer, and I, I, I've never felt lap pull downs in my biceps. I just, I don't know, intuitively, like I just know to activate my lats. I, I don't know, it just happens. So, yes. and that's what was like kind of a blessing for me is because 
upper body, I think upper body wise, pretty easy gainer. But or you know, at 19 years old, I, I started training the guys at the gym. They were probably fast gainers too. But then at 19, I started. I was a head strength coach at a pretty good college or high school. I mean, out in California, so I had a chance to start working with people that like, you know, I wasn't used to people that, you know, freshman year can't pitch the bar. I didn't. I didn't really know they existed. But luckily, early on, because I think you people gravitate with what they're good at. So like, I've been lifting weights seriously since I'm 12 years old, like on some sort of programming, self-designed, my dad kind of helped me. But I would kind of screw around since like five, I'd sneak in the YMCA rate room. So, but back then it seemed like the people that were lifting were all kind of, there weren't as many, the freaks weren't as freaky, but there was like that, you know, what would now be like the top, you know, 30%, like everybody was like that kind of thing. Like yeah, the average was higher. The average was way, the top was less, but the average was yeah. way oh, higher. Almost definitely. And like, all the construction dudes that are coming work out in their jeans, they're all jacked. And mm-hmm. stuff. It's just how it was. And so that's how I thought everybody was. I thought you just lift weights. That's how you get. And that's just that. Then I started coaching at a high school and we were good, but it was a small high school. And we were like going to like CIF, which is like kind of like also similar to like a state championship would be for California. And it was different starting to work with those type of kids, but they kind of gave me an awareness of like, I got to be ready for any type of per- person I'm going to encounter because there are people that are 14 years old that can't pitch the bar and stuff, mm-hmm. you know? And I wasn't used to that. I, I think I was yet, I think people get attracted to what they're good at. So, like, you say, like, hey, 20 reps, a hard gainer and bench press 80%. No one does that. Well, I think people are going to be attracted to more they're good. So, like, what we think of as a hard gainer. Is not even maybe you're even a real hard gainer because there's a lot of people that are like that don't do this because yeah they're not very good at it to start with. I mean, if you're you know 18 years old, you can't do a push up. Going to the gym might not like sound like fun, you know. Mm-hmm. Or if you can bust out 50 push ups and you never trained, it's like oh this will probably be fun. I'm going to be good at it. Yeah, exactly. And where you fall on the spectrum also changes things tremendously. For sure. <clears throat> there was, I'll never forget this day. It's you know, so I I'm training at Westside, then I would go train my gen pop people mm-hmm. at a commercial a corporate gym is actually what it was. And I had the 21 year old soccer player and we just squatted. So she was squatting mm-hmm. and I don't know what it was. I, I wanted to test. I was, I was testing her max on a box squat just to see what it was. Form was finally good enough that we can kind of get an yeah, idea sure. what it was. And it was like a hundred pounds. And I said, okay, fuck it. Let's just take it down. We took it down to 80. And I said, just do as many as you can. She's like 24 reps. And I'm thinking in my head, it's 80% for 24 yeah. reps. Then I'm doing the math in my own head. Like, what's my max? I can do like fucking five yeah. with that. And that's when things started to really change in my head. Like how this percent, like what the fuck does this percent thing really mean? Right? Because your technical efficiency isn't there. Mm-hmm. That obviously she's stronger than a hundred pounds. She's just not displaying it. Mm-hmm. Right. So sure. that, that, that starts to mess with my too. mind a lot with that. Yeah. Mental parts too. There's like, I mean, that's why I think, um, sort of was the, you know, what you guys saw a lot of was like five, three, one. I think that's part of what made it popular was that AMRAP set because mm-hmm. like for a lot of times people could like say, follow like a bigger, faster, stronger, similar in reps but there, there wouldn't always be an AMRAP set. So then like, you know, if you're like the technically inefficient slow gainer or whatever you are, you don't really get much out of the workout because you didn't have to stimulate it. So like, mm-hmm. that's why like the mass market programs and stuff I've done, a lot of times I'll use things like rest pause and stuff because the beauty of like a method like that is if like you're a fast gainer, I'm a slow gainer, you go, say we do like, you do 85%, you do five reps, two reps, one rep, you know, with a 30 second, 20 second break in there. I go 12, seven, six or something. So we both are kind of, you know, in a group setting using the same weight and we both got the stimulation we needed kind of thing mm-hmm. where, where I think that's why some of these programs have done well, you know, in the first one of those kind of be like a five, three, one is it had that AMRAP set in it. And I think a lot of stuff was missing that because, you know, per, the weird thing about percentages too is like the stronger you get the more, you know, they want the, the bigger the jumps are when they're really smaller. So like 5% jump, Oh, let's squat 80% for, you know, five sets of five. You squat a thousand. Like, I mean, come on, get real. And it's not going to happen. But then you're supposed to jump up 5%. Yeah. Where you're, oh, let's do a, <laughs> let's do a hundred pounds squat for five sets of five. 
probably this person could add five pounds a week for a while and not to change a damn thing and keep going. Mm -hmm. But they're jumping 5% a week. I mean, so that's the other problem with percentages. If you try to progress people the same way, the stronger people are taking much bigger jumps and it should be the complete opposite. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. That's an interesting point. <laughs> it's, well, these are things that I don't think people think about, right? They'll just find that program and then do the program. And even at the higher levels, they're still doing the same things because they. Well, th that's why I think RPE got popular. And, and there was a lot of good with that. But then like, I don't think that, I think people like we were talking about earlier, a lot of times lack the self-awareness because a lot of these people, even if they're not doing it for like social media, like fame and f fortune, whatever, there's still like this, uh, this sport attracts aggressive personality. So a lot of people are going to overshoot it. But then they've had the opposite where like certain people, you know, I've experimented because I'm not opposed to using that. I will use that with some people, just not majority. And it's like, everything you say is an rp of 10 but i can tell you can do you know seven more reps yes like, come yes. on well if you have somebody that is say it's it's your say it's an rp that i ask you to do like do this for uh eight rpe well in what mindset like are you are you are yeah, you allowed to get psyched that. right because i mean if you I, I can just do like just normal me you know and just be you know a, in a training state Right. Or I can be in a competitive state. <laughs> There's a big fucking difference there. Your C Max versus your T Max, like yeah. Al Sif was talking about in Super Training. Exactly. Exactly. Like, and there is that because I think that's why the Bulgarians have gotten away with that. Because when I was experimenting with that higher frequency SWAT stuff, when I still didn't feel good on it, but I never psyched up. It's kind of weird. Like I don't, I never got like, for the most part, too crazy. And, and it only meets not in training, but like trying to like, do like a max lift for the day at like the level we're talking about right here. I, um, I mean, if I was competing, I'll do what it takes to get the results, but it wouldn't be fun to me. I I don't like to get like even I don't get psyched when I train like strongman and stuff. But now I don't get crazy, but I I don't do it in this state either. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like yeah, it, it's more heightened than this certainly. Oh yeah, <laughs> and that, that would be weird to me to like you know just go in there and train that way. To, to where you're doing that every single day and just kind of like working up to your max. But at this level, I, I just don't find that stimulating. And I think if I was going to compete, I could deal with it. Like I understand there could be like to be the best, there's going to be like drudgery and things like that. But I think, you know, the, what I'm training now is I always say like, I'll take 90% of the results, but like a hundred percent love what I'm doing versus like, I'm going to like, you know, get optimize everything and not enjoy it. Well, that's yeah. Everybody's mindset is going to play a little different. Mm -hmm. When I was in college, it's um, in the NSA journals, you know, Angel Spazov had mm -hmm. like a six week thing. Okay. So there's a squat program in there. I'm like, fuck it, I'm going to do it. So I got yeah. a five week program. But I did remember there was a certain notation in there that it wasn't, I mean, it was a long, it was, a, you know, five journal article. I mean, it was long to go through there. It's a little notation about something about relaxed mind, something like that. Like, because you work, basically you'd work up to a max and then your work sets were based upon that max. For sure. Then you'd work up to the max again. Then the next work sets were based upon that. And your, your mental state wasn't supposed to be heightened until the very last one. And so that, that was the hard part, right? Cause that hasn't, that wasn't how I normally try. And how would they say you're supposed to be heightened at like what kind of level? Just competitive normal, or like, no, like, tra no, like normal training, training, like under training level. Like training level became really only when you got past the first okay. max. Cause the, I believe the one week was four maxes, right? So it's a max mm -hmm. to determine your 80% and then a max to determine like the 90% right. and then a max to determine the 95%, which what interested me about all that is you kind of know the percents for real. Like the, the max wasn't to me in my brain, the max wasn't the important part. Maybe it's training the skill of lifting the heavy weight, but that wasn't the important part. It was, it was setting the weight for the percentage that needed to be trained. Yeah. So then moving on after that pre West side, I started working on, okay, what if I'm warming up that day, what is my perceived max? Like, how does this feel at 315? What do I think I could do? What do I think I could do at 405? And trying to be real fucking realistic with myself. Like this isn't the best day. I'm not squatting a PR today. You know, this isn't, but it's, let's say it's around 725. Then I'd ask my training partner, you think I could hit 725 today? Yeah, fuck no. All right, so let's 675. Yeah. All right, well, it's an 85% day. 
So we're going to base it on this perceived yeah. max, right? And that began to make more sense with me percent wise than basing it on some shit I did four months ago in a me that I super compensated for and was on peak drugs for. Yeah. You know, everything was different than, than that, but now that condensed because it was high frequency too. So I did make really good gains in that short period of time, yeah. but I don't like to talk about it much because I don't want people to do it. But that was all I did. I didn't do any, I did nothing else. It was just that because I was too fucking tired to do anything else. And so I was able to recover barely, mm -hmm. but if I would have been mentally more aroused, I wouldn't have recovered. But, and I think the only reason why I had the gains that I got out of it is I became more efficient at lifting weights when I was tired. You no, know, so, so it just kind of reinforced that technique. What do you think? But the program, was it enjoyable to you or you just committed to do it? So I'm going to finish it or was it like, I committed to do it. No, it was yeah. enjoyable because it's fucking hard. It's like three and a half hours for a See, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't like those kind of, pro I mean, I like hard programs, but I never, really, I, I, I liked, you know, more. I don't really like not much conjugate or anything, but I like a little more variety. Oh, I it. needed more variety yeah, for, sure. for sure. I mean, I did it because I was going to, I was not going to do it again. There was no doubt about that because this fucking sucks. It's yeah. weird. You're talking about that feeling of the weight. I always felt like in tune with that on bench press. Like I could tell exactly how fast a weight would move. And like, it's same with like watching Julius. You can like tell exactly almost like, you don't want to mess with his head, but I can tell pretty light what's going to happen. Um, Jeremy Hornstrom was kind of like the same way as you can like see what's going to happen where personally like it's squat I maybe I didn't get good enough or what but I never felt like like to me like past like about 405 feels pretty heavy like mm -hmm. like over 900 it's, like, oh, yeah, 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 it's yeah, kind yeah, of yeah, like yeah it's not like I pick up like 600 ever and I'm like dude this is like nothing today and I know if I don't respect 500 even do over 900 it's not going to end well mm -hmm. where i felt like a you know bench i you had a little more leeway and could feel things out better and stuff but the squat i was good with the bench not so much deadlift i was totally in tune with too yeah deadlift i had no fucking idea it was all heavy it all sucked dude I, well I, it's funny because i'm different than most people I, I felt like my bench came on early and i made gains at it early like i was good at benching young like real young but like squatting took me a few years. I mean, it took me um, I would, a lot of years to get up to 500 and stuff. It just wasn't like, I think my, like it was a more of a technique thing probably because I, I, not that my technique is necessarily bad. It wasn't the same, like each squat, like you could look at it and be like, oh, that guy's a decent squatter, but it wasn't like the same rep. There was no pattern being built. So like, it was like a muscle confusion by accident kind of thing. I just never got it really dialed in until I got a lot stronger. It took a long time where bench kind of just, um, I, I guess a lot of people more, where I trained at initially, it was more of an upper body, not as many people at the YMCA were doing like yeah, lower yeah. body. So I'd see people that are good at benching and I just, you know, a little kid knows a bother. You just sit there and stare at them and watch them and kind of pick things up, I think. So my bench came on real, real good through high school. I mean, I benched 500 before high school. This Okay. no bench or shit like that kind yeah. of the same thing as you except yeah. didn't get to the 600 you know summer after high school 520 yeah. raw wow, wow you know then that's you know, ahead of i was at that point yeah well it fucking didn't go far after that you know but um but i think the reason for it was i didn't know all the gyms i was in that people everybody was benching 315 400 pounds i didn't know that it was good to do 315 you know i was when yeah, you're around those all the time all the time you know it's like i'm not seeing people i don't i don't train with the high school football team and you know I, I don't know i hear the numbers and shit like that but it's like this is like fucking three a plate was on the bar just every time you walked in the gym you know the bars weren't unloaded i mean it, back then it was like if you didn't start with the fucking plate yeah, on each sure. side you just didn't bench i guess i don't know yeah no, i remember that <laughs> i mean it's it's stupid as hell looking back on it now but i wonder that's why i'm asking because you kind of had that same experience as you know how much of this is like just genetic freak or it's just the fuck we didn't know any better there's there was the aspect of the environment was probably there too because i'm trying to think of the, when i trained with steve hall we were for a while at this gym called uh, it was called Body Shaping in Oxford that changed to Golds. And I, there was like all sorts of people in there. Like, like there's gangsters from Oxford doing over four plates on bench. There was like this, um, 
uh, it was a Japanese guy. It was a doctor. who's older guy, like 50. And was like, not, I don't know what he weighed. He wasn't big. He was doing like 365 raw. It's just like yes. all these people, like a non-assuming looking dude is like, you look at him. Okay, this guy can do 365. Well, I'm a hell of a lot bigger than him. Yeah, so like, I like 315 be sucked. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yes. no, for sure. And like, even like the random bodybuilders and stuff, you know, repping 315, like touching it near their neck and like in a perfect mm-hmm. explosive sequence kind of thing. It was just. God, I used to do that shit. You got, you got used to it and you got, there just wasn't, there was just a lot of. I mean, like I said, it wasn't many freaks, but there's a lot of people that average was pretty dang high. Mm-hmm. Let's take a bathroom break sure. real quick. Take a- hey guys, if you're a strength athlete, coach, trainer, or practitioner, the Swiss Symposium in Columbus, Ohio at the Easton Town Center, time's running out. It's October 20, 21st. And we have a $200 discount running right now. As I said, seats are starting to fill. So head over to EliteFTS.com, register today. Today's episode is brought to you by Element, a tasty electrolyte drink mix with everything that you need and nothing that you don't. In other words, no sugar, no artificial coloring, no artificial ingredients, no gluten, no fillers, and no BS. With Element, I love the watermelon. The watermelon tastes freaking awesome. I drank one pack every day, no matter what, people that train out here, it's sitting out here for them all the time. The boxes don't last very long. Right now, Element is offering Table Talk listeners a free sample pack with any purchase. That's eight single serving packages free with any Element order. Get yours at drinkelement.com backslash Table Talk. The deal is only available through the link in the description. The other thing is if you don't like it, you can just give it away to a salty friend and Element will give you a 100% refund. No risk, money back guarantee. Head over to drinkelement.com backslash table talk. Hey guys, if you're a strength athlete, coach, trainer, or practitioner, the Swiss Symposium in Columbus, Ohio at the Easton Town Center, time's running out. It's October 20, 21st, and we have a $200 discount running right now. As I said, seats are starting to fill. So head over to EliteFTS.com, register today. All right, so let's just stay on the same subject of Mm -hmm. the environment that we grew up lifting in, you know, as far as, because that's, that's a mental thing too, because it's the perception. Mm -hmm. And when I'm, we were, when I was, took the bathroom break, I was thinking about, you know, the bench, yes, that's what I was seeing, but where, why would, for myself, why did the squat become one that I fell more in tune with and like mm-hmm. the most. And I think it's because in that first gym I was in, everybody was super supportive. Cause I'm just a 12 and a half year old, 13 year old kid. Yeah. Except this one fucking guy. Right. And he like had this ego and he had like a 550 squat and he thought he was the shit. Mm-hmm. I just wanted to beat him. Gotcha. Right. So then I would watch him squat and I would see, you know, the bar path was kind of like all over the place. Mm-hmm. And one of the guys was saying his bar path sucks. I didn't know what that meant. You know, and then I'm reading, it was in Powerlifting USA, I'm sure. Like, mm. that's when I saw Fred write about compensatory acceleration. Okay. Right. And then I'm like, well, what if I just stood up really fast? Then all of a sudden my squat started to go up. Then I had another guy in the gym saying, or let's, let's make your bar path straight. And then all of a sudden it just started to just, take off I was, I was always i was always more explosive than i was strong mm-hmm. well now i was able to actually display that whereas before you know when you're falling forward and right doing a good morning and shit coming out of that it really didn't really and on the bench i think i was able to display that some easier movement to kind of learn for sure you know you know push through there on the deadlift there was no rebound you know, there's no eccentric to no be eccentric. able to load, to be able to come through. So that's just dead straight starting sprain, starting strength, which I didn't really have that. I found it helped me to kind of get that, to mimic that would be rolling the bar. If I could drop my ass just at the right time. Because mm-hmm. I remember I was doing that and a guy, older guy told me not to do that. He's like, D- that's not a good idea. And he, he was a good lifter. So, and he wasn't being a jerk, I could tell. He's, I'm like, okay, so probably not. I told the Gary Frank, 
Gary, I just Gary Frank looks at me. He's like, he's not deadlifting 900, brah. Come on, do it. And I'm like, all right. And it just kind of, once I got that timing down, I felt like I had a built-in like stretch reflex eccentric right off. The I can see that. I tried that, but man, the timing was a bit. Yeah. If you time it wrong, you're screwed. Yeah. Your, your gut gets a little bigger. Time, your timing mm -hmm. gets fucked up. Sometimes I think though, if the guys get big enough, that's the only way they're ever going to do it. Yeah. Your gut gets too small from bodybuilding too. It can throw your timing off, even though you're getting a more optimal position. You could like drop too low to get the starting right. So it's kind of weird. You have to be like at that right. Curve. Yeah. Yeah. With your, I think your last book was on mental training, right? Mm -hmm. And that one I haven't picked up yet, but I do have all your other ones okay. out there. Right. But <clears throat> do you go into, how do I want to say this? Is it like all the other ones out there? Or are you going into techniques that people can actually use? This one's more into techniques that people can actually use. So there's like left of like, here's why it works. Just like a, it's more like techniques of things people actually use. So where would you start somebody say, cause I, I, I get this a lot. I know how to visualize. I've learned how to visualize years ago. I think it was Judd mm. by a soda, right? Oh, his articles his books, were good. Right? And is he still it, alive? I was trying to look that up the other day. I, I don't know, but he, the one of the books that he had, I remember you stare at like a pencil or you stare at a candle and you focus and, you know, kind of work right. everything out from there to kind of learn that. And where now when you try to explain things to people, they're like, well, I try, but, you know, I get distracted and all this other kind of stuff. So, yeah, because he's writing a different audience. They people have iPhones and stuff back then. So people are probably a little stronger concentration. Yeah, I didn't, yeah it's fucking obvious, but I didn't think about that either. <laughs> So where, where would you start? I started honestly with this. So I started like, I get off subject here slightly, but on subject is I started training with a hypnotist. So, um, I was having issues sleeping and, um, I thought, um, I tried Ambien that pill mm -hmm. and I was like up in the middle one night. Um, I don't drink beer hardly at all, but we had some of the house and I took it and I was up in the middle of the night, like popped a beer off and was like eating raw potatoes. I mean, just bizarre, right? Like, no, no, like it wasn't like it was mixed with other drugs or alcohol. Just like, okay, this is probably not the best thing. So I'll try hypnosis and it, it worked great. Mm -hmm. And then, so I, I actually started training this hypnotist. I think he might actually be one of the first people to die of COVID because he died March, 2020 before there was like anything going on. He was, I don't know how old he was. He was no spring chicken though. He mm -hmm. had to be like 80 something. Mm -hmm. And I learned so much from this guy. And I was actually planning on going up to, to, to his place to get mentored by him for about three or four days. But um, I ended up getting like a certification in hypnosis, which was kind of a waste of time. But I learned a ton from this guy. So with the visualization, I think, yeah, you, like how you do what you're saying. Um, well, just, you know, where do they where do they start? Like, because there's I think they need to start just by decluttering their life. Right. So sure. there's less distractions to be able to come in in the first place. I think people skip that. But then that becomes a problem. Like if they're being distracted when they're trying to focus, I think you can start off by if you, you you should be able to lay down and just take a deep breath in, let it all out, and count to fifty doing that without getting distracted. If you get distracted, start you know you can start over or whatever. But like you should be able to do fifty routinely. Like a little while ago, I was just laying down here because I had to travel a bunch yesterday mm -hmm. and all this stuff. So like for ten minutes, I just did deep breathing and felt re-energized. I mean, so I think there would be like, you have to be able to do stuff like that because if you can't count to like, you know, even 25, 50 breaths, you're not gonna be able to sit there and, and, and do a mental movie. Cause I like to think of it as more as a mental movie. I'll tell you why is the first, one of the, I used to do these all the time, like to the point of like craziness. Cause I, I sometimes I do them driving even cause I go so far. And I remember like one of them was with um, deadlifting. Like um, it was deadlifting at the APF seniors. I was seeing it and I knew Gary Frank would be there. And I could smell like the chew he would mm -hmm. skull. He'd always have it in his mouth. I could smell it like in the visualization. So I like to call it mental movies. I think like when you do that, you like integrate all of your senses into it. So it's not just a picture you're seeing. A picture may be the most important part, but there's a lot of other factors that can help you too. Like, mm -hmm. you know, integrating all of your senses and, and things like that. But I think you're right. You have to declutter your mind. If you can't concentrate now, you, you know, it's gonna be tough to do. But everybody does like, have some sort of mental movies to a point you also can work on controlling your internal dialogue as best you can i think if you get like your self-talk better you have more of a chance to be able to like be in control of things i think everybody under everybody will get that mm -hmm. how do they implement that well 
Did I bring that? It might have. The black one. Okay. Well, so yeah. with the self talk, um, mm -hmm. I got actually, I never use notes on this, but I know it's a special one. So I brought some notes. So I think a lot of it comes down to um, just what you say to yourself. And, um, you know, because your, your subconscious mind basically believes what it's told so you could like start with the basics of just not you know also how you start your day i'll tell you we can go backwards a little bit i start my day with what i call priming um i think you've probably you know what that tony mm -hmm, robinson mm -hmm, said mm -hmm. i know he does that's where i initially like kind of learned about it from is basically you get up um take some deep breaths you think about um something that a couple two to three things you're grateful for just kind of like see it feel it that kind of thing then two or three things you think you're you know that made you feel powerful be like you know first time i benched 500 or something and replay that in your head and then kind of then you then you go about your day from there so i think you can start doing stuff like that i think you can start with the right self-talk of not saying negative things about you because i'm by no means like a sports psychologist what if i was like yeah, yeah if i'm a trainer um of psychology stuff i'm the biggest bro scientist you're in yeah 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 but, uh, but it works. You know, I get what <laughs> you're saying. Whereas I think where now I, I see where you're going here and the step, the step that I would miss because it's, you know, the, where I would start is, you know, declutter all the bullshit in your life. Right. So first off, that way you don't have those distractions or at least of eliminate course. those as much as you possibly can. And then there's vice with self-talk. I think what most people think about is, um, you know, when you say a statement and then you reformat the statement that you said in a different way. It could be that way. Right. So th that's how I would, that's how I see it, but it's not what it really is. Right. You can put those statements in before those other ones actually occur. Well, you could, you can, and you can also do the same statement. So if you said like, okay, for example, I'll do one that I'm big on is I say like saying the problem is versus my problem is. Yeah. Because when you say my, you take ownership yeah. over it. So that doesn't take, if you can't, if you're not able to visualize yet, that doesn't take any effort. You can do that. Anybody can do that that wants to. So you can do little things like that. Like just the way you talk about something, are you, are you, you know, are you hoping for it or expecting for it? If I go to the lottery, if I go to the store and have two extra bucks and want to buy a lotto ticket, it's a billion dollars for fun. I hope I win it, but I don't really expect to win it. Mm -hmm. Where um, I come here expecting this podcast will go well. I'm not hoping. So I, it's a true expectation. So I think the way you talk about those things, you know, your subconscious mind doesn't you know differentiate between like you know truth and uh, true and false it's going to believe what you tell it you're its master so you basically gotta you know it believes what its master does and that comes down to your self-image too like what you believe about yourself because your subconscious mind doesn't want to view you as a liar Either they've caught like you know people that have done the worst crimes in the world no one like really views themselves as bad or a liar so even the worst person in the world is one thing to a liar so you're going to behave consistently with your self-image so i don't know this is where it gets a little tricky is like this kind of some kind of law of attraction thing or is this just because like if we start talking about like my kid the other day asked me what a camper shell was so i explained it now everywhere we go goes there camper shells i'm yeah, like yeah. i didn't know we had them anymore like mm -hmm. everybody's got them now it's because mm -hmm. we're all looking for them now so it's yeah. like could be is it like i don't know what what the reason is i just know what it is i think the accountability thing is a big thing right <clears throat> I was just speaking to somebody about this a little that this last weekend, and it's something I'm drilling into my kids' yeah. head is, you know, everybody wants to place fault, you know, everywhere else. And it's easy to do, you know, but how can you place it back on yourself? You know, so even if you're, if you're driving down, one example was one of the kids I, <clears throat> that I talked to a guy sideswiped, mm -hmm. you know, just driving down the road completely. Yes. Not his fault. Right. You know, he didn't have to drive down that road. You know, he still chose to drive down that road at that time. Yeah, for sure. So then it is. And what I'm trying to explain to them is that you can find a way to always bring it back to your own self accountability. Then you have control of your own self accountability. If you're a person that always blames shit on everybody else, you've just taken control away from everything that you ever do. That's what I, that, that, to me, that's more scary to give away control. Like it is. So I, I'd rather. Yeah, yeah. So as long as you can keep that accountability, like, yes, this podcast is going to be good because I'm going to make it good. And if it goes bad, I fucked up. Yeah. I wasn't prepared well enough for sure. 
you know, I didn't, you know, handle this or do this or this. And then now you have something to work on. Even if it does go bad, now you have something you can go work on because for sure. you're accountable for it. If you blame it all on somebody else, you can't do shit about it. You just stay in the same place. Well, I think also a lot of it comes down to is like, you know, so thought we talk about working start to thoughts spoken out loud are more powerful than if they're held in. So like, if you have like negative things to say about yourself or about like, you don't have to say that out loud. You know, you don't have to, you can just hold that in and you're gonna, you can eventually replace. You can't just, it doesn't work to say, Hey, don't think about that. You know, don't think about the pink mm -hmm. elephant. Everybody's about the pink you got to think about something else. So you eventually can replace that thought. And I think by not speaking it out loud, you kind of like, or, you know, that's the opposite of like, if something's more positive, you can speak it out loud. It's going to be more powerful if it's out loud than if it's within. So I don't, I don't think you necessarily need to spill your guts yeah. on every negative thing you feel. No, that makes, okay. So if we're to peel this back, yeah. you know, daily affirmations help. For they sure. work, you know, being able just to breathe and relax, mm -hmm. you know, is part of that. Yep. Um, not putting your negative shit out there for everybody to see. Yep. Right. So we're not even getting to the what, candle. Like, <laughs> we go on social media or something. What's it going to help? I mean, maybe, maybe it will help. Maybe it's like, Hey, you know what? Like I had a horrible day or whatever, because you know, I was driving the street and someone left their trash can out. Maybe someone will see them put the trash can away. I don't know, but I'm saying a lot of stuff is like totally useless. So I, maybe it's cathartic for some people to, I don't, I don't know. I wouldn't think so. I, I'm just like, you got to be like pragmatic about things too. This isn't just like it. Cause it sounds, sounds like people think like, you know, you talked about Tony Robbins earlier. Like it's all kind of touchy feely. It's not like that. A lot of it's just like pragmatic pragmatism is this useful or not. And is it useful to, to, to put all your dirty laundry out there? You know, it's like people, I think a lot of people will say, Oh, I'm being vulnerable. No, you're just trying to call attention to yourself, you know? And, and a lot of times it is that is it just like, you know, there is a time. It's great. If you need help, get help you know you should but i'm saying just to put things out there like you know got cut off on the road today great start to the day and you know post on instagram or something i just don't see the point well actually at that point you've now thought about it more than once right because you got cut off you got pissed or whatever yeah. it was now you just posted about it again exactly right so you just doubled the amount of time that you were actually focusing on that then something other than that and at, th at this point, we still haven't got into the point where you would even begin to try to visualize what a lift would look like. No. But like everything else in training, they want to go there first. Right. Where you can't go there first until you're able to actually put your mind in the state to be able to go there. Well, do you like so for you, for example, like when you were a kid, you didn't have like date. I mean, I, I oh yeah, daydream. Yes. But that's kind of channeling them. It's the same thing. I, I I mean, I, I maybe again, like I said, I don't, can't speak for everybody else because like I told you before, I was genetically good in the upper body, being all these strong guys, then get to the high school to kick camp, bitch to bar. So I, sometimes you're not in reality. Like just if you grow up, all the houses are $10 million. You know, it's not how everybody lives kind of thing. There's everybody's got like their advantages and stuff. So I don't know. Maybe one of my gifts is being able to visualize and it comes pretty easy. But I, I, since I was a little kid, I had some sort of like daydreams and like, I don't know, like I just figured out somehow to like channel these like to productive. Like I, I used to get, I mean, I used to, it was weird. Somebody asked me about this the other day. If I remember if I used to, I used to play basketball real competitively. That's why my first good sport. We were on a travel, kind of like pioneered traveling kids teams when I was like, you know, fifth, sixth, seventh grade, we go around the state and even other states. And, um, I would always take a shower before we were a traveling game i go in the hotel i put like i used to listen to ice cube or something i put it really loud put it really hot and i'd sit in there and just visualize the game because like a lot there was like you know some of the best teams but you kind of knew who the better teams mm -hmm. were to watch mm -hmm. them and i'd play the whole game out in my head and like you could go, like go on for like an hour or something and i don't know how i learned that i just kind of figured i guess what happened is you see yourself doing something you do it um, I remember the first time I one of my most vivid ones was I was in sixth grade. There was this thing called the turkey trot. You have to chase somebody wearing like a dress as a turkey. And it was a cross college cross country runner. But they go kindergarten, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. So I'm like, dude, they're going to be tired by then. Yeah. No one's ever caught the turkey. I just kept seeing myself catch the turkey. I don't think I was the fastest in the class yet, but I caught the turkey. And I just remember seeing it beforehand. I'm going to like chase this dude down and he's just going to like, submit i'm gonna grab that thing, yeah. fake turkey thing 
by the end of the, the thing. And it ended up being like another one, you know, another time we did the hypnosis. I remember one of our high school football coaches brought in a hypnotist. And I remember like, I jacked this kid up so bad too in practice. And I remember just, we were doing this drill. And I could see it unfold of like, right when the hole would open playing linebacker. And I mean, I just exactly, like I just had those, some of those experiences that happened exactly. Squatting at the APF seniors, I remember like just replaying exactly how those, that was probably my best one. I just remember how those attempts were going to move and it just, it happened. I mean, I guess the other thing is like, you know, when you don't do it right and you know, it doesn't go how you think it's going to go, you, you, the tough part's like to not to 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 not unwaver. You want to yeah, you just got to let it pass. You got to let it pass. Like yeah, yeah. So you're bu- you're having buy in to when it works, and you're blaming on your own self if it doesn't work. And yeah, it's kind of a weird thing, but that's just how it rolls. With the with the, with the football with the with the, sh- the shower and stuff like that, did that shower become a trigger? For sure. Okay. So the triggers now is like. One of the, 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 I did an NLP certification too. And you know what that is? It's kind of mm-hmm. like the Tony Robbins that started. So one of them is like, you just, you know, you, you do have different triggers. Um, and one of them is like, I figured out was like, this guy's like, just think of something you feel powerful. I think of benching 600 the first time. And I just could like hold my fist a certain way and immediately draw power that way. So yes. you can definitely do things. Like think about all the negative times of like a certain person you see that puts you in a bad mood, like a uh, certain when my dad were walking somewhere and he smelled like horses, like this is exactly how it smelled like when he used to play football in high school at practice. It smelled like this. So like we all have these kind of triggers and we all have these daydreams. Are you channeling them? I guess it comes down to more channeling it than like you're already doing it. Yeah, you're doing it. And you can, <laughs> well, you can redefine, you can refine it where with, I went through a flotation tank study when I was in high school when I was powerlifting. As That's well. like pioneering. They, no, no, it was. Doing it it was. I mean, because there was a hypnotist there. So we were, we were doing all kinds of shit, you know, learning how to get deeper and learning how to let the thoughts go when they're not right. But then when you're in the current and when you're in the state that you want to be in and everything's perfect, you know, for me, it was C red, you know, I got to pick the color, yeah. like just close, it was just C red. And then close my eyes, C red, then bam, that, that state, it's a trigger. Yeah. Right. And then over the years with certain other things, if I'd be visualizing it, maybe something I mark on my chest or it's a trigger. For sure. And then it's this it's another there's different levels, right? So there there's like a level that if I go to that, I'm not gonna recover for two fucking weeks because I'm on Pluto at that point. That's a different level. That's a different level that people don't talk about, but that's that's a crazy level. That's a crazy level, right? So I got a trigger for that, you know, and but that's that's where you try not to go unless you have to go. You know, it's a choice. Sometimes I'd like to go there, you know, so you, yeah. there's, there's that as well. But I think if, once you start to lock in your ability to be able to do that, you got to start finding I, the triggers. Tr- like that last meet I did, like a deadlift meet, um, I'd been out of powerlifting and um, came back and didn't want to hit over 800. So I hit 810. I missed on the first, second attempt, but caught on the third attempt, like really easy. I don't know what I could have done that way, but. My best was 790 in training, so I, I knew I was good for I for 810 at least. And um, I took myself to that level on that last lift. I, I don't know what I could have done. It's on YouTube. It was freaking easy. And so it wasn't like one of those lifts. Like typically you think of that CNS grind of like I've had those squats where they just wipe you out. Mm-hmm. And like, you you know, but this was not that. It was like, okay, it's your opener kind of lift. But I just hit it so perfectly. And I remember Steve Hall came out there from California to watch the meet and was stay at my house. And um, I remember like I couldn't go to sleep. So I went to the store, we drank some beer to, and it finally got me to sleep. And I remember like, I felt like in two or three weeks, like when I, I mean, we're luckily at the time is right after football season. So it wasn't like, it was kind of like a downtime of just like not as intensive a schedule. But I remember when I was coaching at the school, I, I, I'd feel like sometimes I'd be watching the kids and, oh, I'm here. You know, I got to like almost like get back into it. About two weeks it went away, but that was crazy. Oh, yeah. How, I mean, unless it's happening, you don't know. Right. <laughs> it's, <all right. laughs> it's getting back to the practical advice I think that could help people today, though, would be, you know, we, we grew up in a little bit different time. Right. Right. So we grew up at a time where if you went outside, you didn't have a Walkman, you didn't have this other stuff. It's just you, your thoughts, and that's it. 
Mm -hmm. There's no there's no real distraction unless you're trying to not get hit by a car. But if you're, you know, out walking in the country or whatever, walking to school, there's just it's just you and silence in your brain and your thoughts. Yes. Right. I was driving a car before the radio really wasn't worth a fuck. Right. So probably broke. Yeah. So if I drive was driving anywhere, it's just silent. I think people need to learn how to find time where they're just silent. There's no distractions. There's no fucking reels. There's no YouTube. There's no music. There's no earbuds. It's just them and their own thoughts. Right now, I bet for most people to do that for five minutes would drive them De- fucking crazy. Declutter the monkey mind, as Fred Hatfield would say. Yeah, just give it time, you know, to actually to think, you know, without something else in there where they can do that first. Then maybe they'll get to a point where they can have the radio on and drive and still think. You know, where I guess that maybe that's secondary. So apparently if people say that if um, I read this in a book and I I forget the name of this book, but it was basically saying that if you go out into the wilderness or something like the first two days, if you got no devices or anything are kind of like a little nerve wracking. Then by the third day, you almost get to like this euphoria type of thing. And other people are kind of confirming it. I don't think people could go. I don't think most people, if they're under 35 now could go out in the woods by themselves for two hours and not have it be nerve wracking without something in their ears. Yeah. I mean, it's weird. You kind of get used to it though. Cause like I'll go like, um, pig hunting at night and out there. Like they're not, mm-hmm. I thought I was out there for two, an hour, five hours. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I, it's kind of like you get used to it and you like, it's like you enjoy it once you like at first kind of boring. You're like, okay, this sucks. And like, then once you like embrace it, you're kind of like, okay. Yeah. But if we peel this back now to the people that are asking you, how can they visualize their lips, but they can't, you know, not have stimulus in their brain for more than they have 10 to lose minutes. The stimulus. I mean, the easiest way to do it. Uh, yeah. I get what you're saying. I'm, yeah. We keep talking about personal experiences. Yeah, yeah. Like, let's make a like a bullet point of what you can do. Do a float tank, float tank. You have no choice in there. <laughs> That's a good one. Or if, yeah, I mean, if you if you, might, you said you've done this stuff. Yeah, I, yeah, I love yeah. floating. Yeah, I mean, I've had full on like hallucinations and float things. <laughs> I mean, I, I've I feel like I've had like conversations with Fred Hatfield and stuff. Mm-hmm. In there. It's like, mm-hmm. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, I think at some point wasn't that initially a form of torture? Wasn't that the initial use of it? Like back in the day? Yeah, or- I don't know. I just I know when I was studying in it, it wasn't like they were now. I mean, it was like a fucking coffin. Yeah, it was a little bit different, and um, but it was the same experience. Well, my I have one at my house, but it's not a it's not a tank; it's a tent, so it's like small. Yeah, so it's you got to really like, real. I mean, but it's like at first, it's like you're touching stuff and it sucks, and then it's like you relax in it, you know. So you fill it up, and then you put the salt in it. Put the salt in it. And it's it's not a high quality one. Yeah, I mean, the high quality ones are like you know twenty thousand. No, yeah, it's yeah. like tw- fifteen hundred or something. And what I did with it is. I don't use it. This is, I don't use it during the winter because it gets too cold. And the point of, because they're saying, it's not like, don't be a pussy. It's like, know the points to relax. So <laughs> I can withstand it. It's just not like, yeah, the point of it. And like, so like, from like, you know, say May to like probably October or something is a good time to, to use it. Do you think it helped with, because I tried it way since then, uh-huh. you know, just a few years ago. Yeah. And it wasn't so much for the mental thing because I can do that without that. It was, just to see if I could get any relief from the the joints not having Absolutely. compression. So the, I was curious on that. So if there's much studies on it, I don't think there is. But I've had, I, I was gone in there stiffed a couple. I've gone like just, I've gone in there and just like, you know, do a static stretch to see where you're at. If yeah. you go before and after, you're way looser. Oh, <laughs> really? For sure. So especially if you kind of like joint stiffness or something. Now I'm not sure if you're already like doing like a ton of mobility and well, that's a metric you can measure though. I was just going off how I felt, you know, I I've actually tried measurable stuff. No, I should have done that. You know, that makes more sense because you're still laying there and what kind of one spot. So something's going to be a little jacked up just by laying in there. But if you're studying a range of motion and joint mobility, that would be interesting to be able to know. I'm curious. I'm surprised nobody has, but, um, I think it would be interesting to see. You would think so, right? Because there's, there's no gravity, more or less. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, so what you do is you basically get like, it comes with some crazy amount of salt, like I don't know, like 800 pounds. You got to throw it all in there, fill it up um, with a hose, and then 
you plug it. I don't, I personally unplug it when I go into things like 15 or bucks and I don't want to get electrocuted. And I, don't, <laughs> <laughs> I don't try it. Yeah. That'd be a <laughs> shitty way to go. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> unplug it. It, it. You know, they say you don't have to, but I do. And then, um, just every once in a while, I'll go over to Walgreens, buy like 50 pounds of salt and throw it in there. And it keeps you, it keeps it buoyant. So it's not like, um, I used to go to a place to actually do it. And it's just like, took up a lot of time and all that. So that's why I couldn't go on because there was 45 minutes there, 45 minutes. Oh, that's it's really? Like a fucking two hour, <clears throat> two hour journey for. And there you also feel like since you had to pay for it and stuff, it's not like you want to, you know, I'm not going to do like for 15 minutes or something because I'm already here. We're like in your house. You can just go in for 15 minutes. Yeah. If you don't have as much time. Staying on the mental thing. Uh -huh. How much with, if you were to take the lifters that you're working with, the top end lifters that you're working with, how much, this is a kind of a loaded question, but not yeah. a fair question either. How much difference do you think it would make if they were to lock that in with their performance? I think most of them are pretty locked in on that's part of the reason they're doing well. I mm -hmm. think, like, I think um, it's hard to say. I think a lot, it's going to improve any, so you're going to get some kind of metric of improvement no matter what, but just how much. Um, I think like the, you know, obviously I don't think like, so we we're talking about earlier, I guess this is not part of this, but we're doing a YouTube video. It was talking about like the, what makes a program successful. So some people, you know, basically say like, they're all the same. And like, as long as it's on paper and you execute it, you're gonna get the same. I don't obviously buy into that, but at the same time, I think like, a, a, a about assuming it's coherent, executed well and adhered to is going to get better than good and not. So mm -hmm. I think it's going to be like the type of thing in general that's going to make good to great. Like you could be like, you know, for what's the, what, the coach, of the Dallas Cowboys said one time, show, you know, show me your slowest mile, mile time will show your best athletes kind of thing. So I think if you're somebody that's, you know, stockbroker weigh 130 pounds, you're on a four minute mile right now and you get into powerlifting, you have the best minds in the world. You're not probably going to squat a thousand, but I think you could still be a lot better. So I think you could go from like, no matter who you are, say you're average, you go to mm -hmm. good, good to great kind of thing. Like, I don't think necessarily it's going to take, I don't think you're going from like the one percentile to 99th necessarily, yeah. but I think, I think it's more than you think. It's not like, you know, your total will go up 10 pounds either. I think like, you know, you see people finally decide to like, um, you know, it's like Julius Maddox's lifts kept going up, but like, it's like, like around 2000, 18 19 he really like kicked it into gear of like this is like you know next level kind of thing so that's locking that in locking that in okay or like tom Havlin just would be locked in of like so certain people you can just see when they like lock in i think tom is more of like a all you know always been locked in julius is always mentally strong but he when he got locked in it was like okay it took it took the you know go from like the you know 600 to mid sixes to go you know 650 ish to like 700 like less time kind of thing it's like i feel like you know with lifting myself i got to um f from four to f 500 600 happened faster than three to 400 four to 500 because a lot of it i think was a mental lock-in now of of that type of stuff for sure so to define that lock-in are we speaking more than confidence a lot of it is confidence, but okay. a lot of it's, but that's, it's a, it's a thing because a lot of the like more daredevil type of lifters are really confident, but they're like, I don't think it's like a good idea to be like, um, you know, going at like going out drinking the night before meet or something or, or like mm -hmm. staying out all night every night. Like, but, but you could do that and still be confident. So there's like a discipline factor to it too. Cause it's like being mentally tough doesn't necessarily mean. I know you talk about you were talking about this the other day. Like, I think we're all mentally tough to a degree, but in different situations, we're like, you know, if your computer breaks right now, I'm not probably mentally tough enough to fix it because I don't know enough about it to like mm -hmm. sit here and just like try to figure it out. Where you're mentally tough not to stress out about it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, but then like mental toughness for like a lot of people are going to be like, they're not, they think like being brave and not scared is mental toughness, but for them, it might be like. 
the discipline not to go out with their friends and you know like three nights a week or whatever so i think it's going to happen in different ways and we're all gonna have to make some kind of adjustments i don't know exactly yeah i think it's figuring out all those little pieces be it if you look at somebody that's taken a max attempt on the bar there's <clears throat> i call it authentic confidence mm-hmm. like some people need to be psyched up some people don't yeah but it doesn't matter where they are on that arousal spectrum as long as they're the the most authentically confident they are yes they're going to make that lift for sure you know if they if they go over that then on that arousal curve they they went too far where that becomes something in the sport of powerlifting which becomes an interesting thing because other lifters will look at them and say think of what they could do if they really got sight i'm like yeah they don't bomb the fuck out you know, because they yeah, want to I mean, do that. I'm sure Ed Cohn had an internal rage. Right? <laughs> oh yeah, but he didn't. He didn't like put on a show. Like literally, someone just um, messaged me today on Instagram saying, like, you know, are people like lifting and yelling. Is this a show? Ba- basically, is, is this necessary? I said, um, if it helps them lift more, it's absolutely necessary. But a lot of times, it ter- it's just a show. Yep. You know, and you can tell the difference. I mean, if you've been, you I know you can. Uh, for sure. You can tell the difference just looking at it. Like this is, actually, this is fake. They're not confident and they're trying to do this to make up that gap of them not thinking that they can do that. And then you can tell as soon as they take it out of the rack. Because, <laughs> I mean, you think about it, powerlifting is one of the, like, Obviously, like I say, reckless abandon, that's not a good term because reckless would mean reckless, but it's closer to that than other sports because like, you know, if I want to, we're playing football and I want to take you out over there, you're running the football, I'm going to come straight at you. I still have to get the right angle. Mm -hmm. Um, I can go like crazy, everything right. But if I miss you, I miss you. Where powerlifting is like real close to being able to like actually hit that full on like Mm -hmm. psyche. So like, you know, Fred Hatfield used to have a category of, um, I didn't, I didn't bring it. I thought I did, but it was like a graph of like different sports of like where you need to be psyching wise. And I remember like one of the higher ones was like football tackling, you know, and like boxing was actually below that because, you know, it's like, Oh well, yeah, but it's long. You can't come out and go crazy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and you, you know, you're done with. And powerlifting was about the aggressive, most aggressive you could get because like, there's not a whole lot to it. You're static and, you know, it's really the only sport where you display, you truly display limit strength. You know, you think about it, like, because everything else, it's important. It's your base for everything. But like, in parallel, you know, what, what's limit strength or max strength? It's, one, you know, one, muscular exertion, regardless of max force, regardless of time. That's mm-hmm. the key is regardless of time. Where most sports are going to, you want to get high forces, but you have to do it quickly powerlifting you don't and you're not moving so you can really get like psyched up and Mm -hmm. but at the same time a lot of people are putting on an act you know you don't need to like you know if you headbutt the bar and it's helping you that and you think it's worth it that's great but a lot of people are putting on an act and i i think you're right you can just tell who is and who isn't Mm -hmm. with one of the things that you had down here was to you know talk about your relationship with fred so we talked about a couple things Right. that you learned from him where you know he was a strong mentor of yours right yep you know so what are some of the things that people don't know um fred is interesting because like honestly him and i were um we were like by the end like a lot of our discussions was not even like having to do with lifting it was like we would talk like philosophy and religion and things like that so i think um I think that's one thing people don't know about him is like, um, even though he was like um, this world-class lifter, he had a lot of different interests and stuff. So you could like talk to him about any subject. You'd be like, you said something about like the Russian revolution, like, Oh, whoever it was in 1918 or something. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like he was really in, um, I think he also was really one of the best minds in sports science, not necessarily powerlifting. I think like powerlifting was like, his base of knowledge and i think another thing is like even like he would always one thing i really liked about him is fred would always tell you if you did good or bad so like he wasn't one of these hard asses that would just like tell you you suck just Mm -hmm. but he also wouldn't like if he gave you a compliment he really meant it it was like he's very honest and um we just would talk all the time and we so what happened how we kind of got started was um we 
a Dom and she and I, uh, who I wrote the Jell Strong on those books, we were doing a MMA course for uh, strength conditioning for ISSA. And like back then, they were doing a lot of courses they didn't even put out. So they, when we, then he, he approved it or whatever. And he said it was pretty good. Then in a bodybuilding one for him. And that one, he was like, I sent him a chapter. He said, basically, he said, this is, I've come to one conclusion. This needs to be rewritten. Basically, it sucks. And, and, uh, <laughs> and then I'm like, oh, shit. Okay. And then <laughs> sent him another one. He's like, this is like the best thing I've ever read. You should be a New York Times bestseller kind of thing. So mm-hmm. they go like back and forth. And so he just said, hey, um, we're, so ISSA at the time, I guess CJ Murphy or somebody made fun of Fred saying like, you do, I didn't know you guys are all these bozu balls and all this and mm-hmm. all that because mm-hmm. they had all this goofy stuff in their book. He's like, and Fred's like, and I guess they've been doing all these edits and he's like, nah, he's like, I need to recruit you. We're going to start doing this together. So we kind of revamped their textbook. Then we started, he invited me on to do a, a tour of like, three or four seminars and ended up being like 25 year old all over the world and so what we would do is we would um we would go to the we would do a seminar is always like clockwork so we go to a seminar and um but it, he didn't want to do pra- i guess he didn't want to do practical because of whatever like why i don't know what the reason mm-hmm. was, but he did not want to do practical so okay go there and talk and we'd always take questions like you know some of these things are people don't ask questions necessarily mm-hmm. while it's going but then they want to stay around after. And I'm like, dude, I'll stay here all night. This is great. I'm like getting paid to do like hang out with Fred Hatfield and do this. I yeah. mean, this is, couldn't get any better than this. This is what I've always, yeah, that's another visual. Mm-hmm. I've always saw myself as one day doing something with him. And he'd always do like this. Once he'd want to answer questions and everybody always look at me. He goes, he always go like this, get him out of here. It's time for a cold beer. So I'd just, all right, everybody get out of here. Mm-hmm. but be like nice i just figure out okay we have to we have a reservation or make something like yeah yeah, yeah get out of here and then we go talk and his wife was always there she we'd go eat and do whatever she would usually go to bed or whatever then like as salary said you don't go to the bar with fred we just stay out i was like bef- always into going to sleep early and all mm-hmm. this but like i couldn't pass up on the opportunity we just sit there and we'd like talk you know till we got closed down usually and and we I just learned so much from him about like told you earlier about the um we talked a lot about the compensatory acceleration thing. A lot of it was pretty cool as we were um doing a seminar over in Japan and it was at the one of the marine bases and I remember we were like walking and we saw these guys doing like some Olympic lifts with bad form, but they were clearly putting forth a really good effort and they were like in good shape and stuff. And I remember we were saying, like, look at that, they'll you know, they'll put in the effort. And it looks really, you know, it's awesome. They'll do it. But we need, we need to give them something better. So him and I wanted to work on a tactical course together for ISSA. And unfortunately, um, you know, he passed away, but I was able to complete it. So uh, I wish he could have saw it because I think it was one of my, you know, best works for sure. And and um, we were so we would just talk all the all the time. And he was like one of my best friends, and learned a ton from him. And and very very helpful very free with his knowledge um he wasn't like big timing somebody if like you come to the seminar and like that's one thing i learned from him too if you have like and most of the time we got pretty good we got good turnouts but that's one thing about that dude like one time um one was not planned out well in like okinawa or somewhere like five or six people there he acted like there's 500 people there like mm-hmm. screaming them on so it didn't matter, like as Sally, the other owner of ISSA, say, so it didn't matter if, you know, it's some gym in Alabama with three people or there's 3,000, Fred's going to give you his all. So, like, he was really good about, he would make sure that if you came and you had a question, you got the proper respect to get that. He wouldn't big time you or anything like that. He gave the same effort no matter no matter who was there. And um, we were... Um, I mean, yeah, we we just sit there and talk training. I remember our last kind of like thing beside the tactical training, I was really trying to sell him on strongman training. I don't think at first he like really bought into it, but then I remember one day we were sitting in the bar and he just goes, there's training, there's good, better, and best. He's like, strongman training is the best. I'm like, yes, I don't know. If <laughs> you've had too much to drink, but you finally said it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was pretty cool. And, and um, yeah, I mean, I learned a ton from that guy and then, Met him through Salaria, the owner of ISSA, and I met him at the YMCA when I was like 12, so it all kind of worked out. 
when Fred would be doing these presentations, what would be the the three takeaways that he was trying to have everybody leave there with? I don't think he had them. I think it was more like deep, like philosophical, broad brace. This is like, I think it basically um, it'd come down to like um, everything requires I think one of the main ones, everything requires strength. So even like if you're finishing a marathon, you still have to have the strength to push through at the mm-hmm. end. So I think that that was like the main thing. His other thing, I guess, no, he kind of would be like the strength curve and talking about compensatory acceleration training and things like that. So he'd really want you to understand that that was very important. So I think those two things would be probably like the two main takeaways. What were his thoughts on that compensatory acceleration if you're speaking hypertrophy work? Um, so he was that that's actually funny you said that because we were talking about that one time a lot. And um, so I think he was he was very he was not buying like he'd be more for it because he was not buying eccentric overloading because he, he kind of like corrected me on that because I, I don't really call it overloading, but I always talk about the time under tension on the negative portion of the rep. He's like, yeah, to a point, but like you can do 50, you know, 30 percent more or whatever it is on the eccentric. So if you're doing 70% of your max of what you can concentrically do, is that really an eccentric overload? An eccentric overload would be somebody, you know, below you with a barbell and you're pushing it down and fight street fighting the way down. So like that kind of stuff, like kind of, cause like the, you know, the typical strength conditioning certification would call, you know, a five second negative on the bench press mm-hmm. an eccentric overload. And he's like, no, 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 I don't think so. It's going to be like, um, you know, it really, if it's an overload, it'd be somebody like pushing down kind of thing. Yeah, like 120%. Exactly. So, you know, talking with him on that, it's like I, I did kind of, you know, experiment some of that stuff on some of like the higher level bodybuilders and stuff, not like so to that degree, but like just even having them like, you know, like weight releasers and things like that, which would be like a true eccentric overload kind of thing. So I think he was good at like also so correcting you on if you just went along with the status quo and didn't really like question it, he called mm-hmm. out on it. And I know that on that one, I did in particular. Where would you fall with the effective rep things that are going around now for hypertrophy? Wait, um, you like the money rep kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think he would um, definitely be in line with that. And I think, you know, he would say you want a compensatory acceleration as much as you can and have the attention there. And, and those last fatiguing reps would definitely be your money rep kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I think he thought like a lot of body orders are missing out and stuff like, um, particularly on eccentric overloads, he would talk about not like the, you know, cause the problem with that is you can adapt to it to, even if you can do it safely, you can still adapt it to re quick. You like, if you start doing like leg curl, with like 130% of your max, at, you know, on one leg and then you do it with two legs and you lower it with one leg or something like, dude, the next day I can't walk. This is like, you know, crazy, but like, you know, three weeks into it, you, it's like you didn't even do anything. So, cause you adapt to it pretty quickly. Yeah. Well, that'd be anything. You know, again be basic but i think east i think eccentric overload and even more so like it's crazy how much muscle damage it seems to cause right off the bat and then how you would seem to adapt to it quicker than you would like say german volume training or something on the other end of the spectrum interesting it was it's also it's also very fucking hard to implement right so now your weight releasers and you gotta reset them on each rep no, no, yeah. no, no. So I, I do more like a controlled eccentric on the way on the first oh, okay, rep, okay. and then rep out after that. Okay, I so get you're it. getting like mm. so say, say you're ten percent of your max, you lower it for five seconds. Say then you compensatory acceleration train it after that. Okay. So you get that one. Yeah, you you're not like fully doing every rep like that. Yeah, it'd be such a pain in the ass. <laughs> I mean, you know, the best the best way. I mean, the only way you try something like that's if you're maybe on a Smith machine, you had someone like put on a twenty five real quick and or something but it'd be kind of again it's like requires two people to to work together and all that stuff but the smith machine at least would take that balance fucker fuckery out of it for sure you know which would be interesting there you said with the tactical training which was you kind of started with him but then finished on your own Mm -hmm. we didn't Uh, get to actually get started on the course we talked a lot about it so yeah um how do you define that first off okay because that's a broad spectrum there for sure so it's kind of like almost like strength conditioning. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah no, I, no, think. I think it would be more like re- response. So t- two ways to look at it. One, it's almost like what people call functional training, but it's, it just, 
you know, in a sense, but it, what it is is like training for um, first responders, like military, you know, cops and firefighters would, would be the main thing. So within the tactical populations, um, within the tactical populations, there'd be a ton of variance because for example, so the cool thing about this course was, so what happened, like a long story short, the way I was training, I started getting contacted by first responders just because I saw what I was doing, thought it would transfer over to what they're doing kind of thing. This was just like, okay, put in my Instagram story kind of thing. It's nothing like there was, it, I wish I could say it was like some smart marketing ploy. It was just like, this is what I'm doing, you know, because mm. I'm, I'm done powerlifting. And um, so what it was, but you, so within this, I started working with a lot of these guys and then I started doing a lot of research. So what I did when I did the course is one of the best ways to figure stuff out for me. I've, you know what Survey Monkey is? Mm -hmm. I just started like, what's the furthest foot pursuit you've ever been in? Well, these tests you're doing are aerobic bias, but literally 97% of the people have never gone over 300 yards. So it doesn't matter. Uh, reality, that's where we got to be quick. Like, yeah. William J. Kramer, I think, was calling it the, you know, soldiers of the anaerobic battlefield. So there's a lot of like, what I'm working with people, getting their feedback, and then just sending out these surveys and kind of figuring out what other people were saying. But I think it's, it's going to be, but there's a huge, variance of like what could be like an operator in the air force or something to like some dude down at the doing border patrol it's mm -hmm. could be sitting for 12 hours that's a tough part then they got a sprint or something so it's going to be any training for first responder i think um there's going to be like a, a functionality i think there's there's um it's i think strength is like your base for it still so like for example like i think like you know i like for to maximize your speed um i think you need like a squat or a deadlift you need about 2.5 times your body weight to like so up to a point if you can get up to those lifts you're going to get faster so like if you weigh 200 you deadlift 350 without doing much running and you get up to 500 you should be faster that's why yeah. I, I don't let powerlifters that want to sprint really do it unless they we do a long acclimation because you got like it's like putting like a hemi engine in like you know a car you know like a prius or something mm -hmm. you know yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. bad mm -hmm. but like assuming someone's tissues able to handle it and they've been doing it like 2.5 times standard on one of those um ultimately like a 1.5 times pull up would be really good body weight pull ups if you weigh 200 you do 300 that's just like excellent this is shooting for like the star so like but that's kind of the goal is using those strength metrics as your base and building off it because like it you know you do need to be strong but at the same time if you weigh 300 and you can't do a pull-up what if you got to climb over something or something then, mm -hmm. you know you're you're rendered ineffective so i've had a chance you know to work with a lot of different people now and these kind of like you know i think a lot of it's like people are training to like they're training to the test rather than like what's in the field so that's how i try to do it differently is like I understand if there's a test you need to pass, but like we talked about earlier with those NSCA tests or something, you need to test yeah. to what they need to test to, which I get it. They say, you have a family, you got to get a promotion. Let's, I'll help you pass that test, but let's not pretend like the 1.5 mile run. Cause like, you know, in Afghanistan, for example, like a lot of the average pack people were are like total external loads, like hundred pounds. So it'd be a much more effective test to see how far can you march with a hundred pounds of external load, you know, yeah. in a certain amount of time, rather than how fast can you weightlessly run? Now I understand the logistics would be a pain in the butt to set that up versus mm -hmm. just go on the track and run the thing. Mm -hmm. So that that's what like the tactical type of stuff is for sure. Yeah. Then how does they get implemented into the training through a, say a micro cycle? Or is, is this a phasically structured thing or are you trying to raise all those components or all those at the same time? For sure. So, the thing the key to this kind of training is you like so we summarize it let's let me let's go back I'll, I'll, yeah i'm not a bullet point person usually i like to philosophical but i'll bullet point you so here we go so we want to move like we're 50 pounds let's say it's like the i call it the 50 cube philosophy is um we want to move like you're 50 pounds lighter have the, the move you know have the endurance of somebody 50 pounds lighter but the strength, the power of somebody 50 pounds heavier is kind of what you're after. Yeah. So that's the ultimate goal. Now, you may not get there, but that in a perfect world, that's what we're at. So you'd be kind of ready for any situation. So you'd be really good at a lot of things and not the best. So it, assuming like someone like this guy named Harry Walker, I work with this Green Beret, been like working with for like 12 years. 
and he's pretty damn good at everything. So we we can definitely basically structure his program. It's just the key is not doing it where you have an artificial strength base because bigger is stronger. So if you keep putting on weight, you should get stronger. But if all of a sudden, you know, you get a back pump walking, you know, a mile or something, you don't have a pack on or something, that, that's not going to cut the mustard. So mm-hmm. you can't you can't go for this with an artificial strength base. You have to do it. You have to like, if you're working strength, there still has to be the component of conditioning to bring up your strength without the artificial strength. I mean, that's true for like football and stuff too. Yeah. You can get, you can get people really strong and big, but they can't move where other people make the mistakes the other way. They're just running them into the ground year round. So they never really get faster because they're not actually recovering on those runs and actually sprinting. It's more uh, exercise and conditioning and a ton of like junk volume sprint wise. So they're in, they're in good like healthy shape, but they're not like faster, and they're not bigger because they're just running it off them all the time. So, so all capacities are held at all times, just at different levels. Different levels. Throughout. So I think that's sort of like you know, I guess the closest you could say would be like to block probably, because I think people misconstrue block a lot of the times because they're talking about it like you're in a strength phase. All you do is strength. Right. No, he was talking in that book about holding these other capacities about twenty percent. Mm-hmm. So if you're um, if you like say for example you're in good aerobic conditioning and you just ruck one or two times a week you probably can maintain it pretty decently you're not going to like set a new standard but you can you can kind of keep that going where you know so that's what i think is like you keeping those other qualities at maintenance and that's where the art of it's going to come in is like you have to focus on probably emphasizing one particular quality but you're going to have to keep the other things on maintenance mode. You can't just like, all right, screw it. We're going to get as strong as we can. And if you get back pumps all into your car, just deal with it like that, that. That won't work. Well, I think that even plays into if a power lifter is basically to use more bumper type block, right. right? Yeah. That still applies. Mm-hmm. I mean, they still have to maintain technique with the barbell on the sure. main lifts, just not with the same loads throughout those hypertrophy phases and actually i think that's one area that a lot of them will fuck up too yeah i mean you can get the bar off your back that's one phase that's a different thing that's yep. a restoration phase sure. but then you run into you know they, they just they don't do anything and then they lose skill then they fall too far behind yeah i mean because it's like i also work with the fort worth pd guys a lot and it's amazing to like um so like 65 percent of like the average cops gears to be over 20 pounds a lot and the SWAT guys are like 66 pounds so they're having to do all this stuff in this heavy gear and a lot of times they're not even really they're not really training for it especially imagine like not ever doing anything for it then just throwing on 66 pounds but you're like an eight hour standoff Mm -hmm. i mean it'd be crazy yeah because it's going to throw everything off like i mean when you're under that kind of load you you get tired and like all other like even like your judgment stuff can be thrown off and like you know, your ability also, you know, reduce situational awareness and like also, you know, your gates off, all that crap's going to happen because you're under extreme fatigue. Yes. So I think that's been sort of like the, the quote, unquote, like ticket to what I'm doing with the tactical athletes is a lot of it comes down to, to, to phasic, to the, that phasic stuff, but the maintenance qualities on hand, not making an artificial strength base. And then also adapting to the situation because like they're gonna have different phases where, Hey, I know I'm not going anywhere or anything like this. Um, I'm on base doing whatever. So I I can like give them a pretty good strength program and like really prescribe weights and stuff versus like they're a good example of when a lot of times an RPE would be appropriate because like if you're out, you know, 13 hours a day in some weird makeshift weight room or something, like an RPA on RPE on a squat would be probably more appropriate than like, okay, we're gonna do like whatever, you know, four fifty five for three reps when, you know, you may have had to walk six miles with 100 pounds or you may have been just sitting there all day we don't know what's going to happen so i think there is a little there's going to be way more flexibility to the program for sure so that would be those with your average tactical so how does that change with tom well see he's able to do he's able to gonna be able to like have a more structured life though so if he's if he was off somewhere else it would have to change like he's able to like when he's training the way he's training twice a day it's a the man is like more committed than anybody else so yeah he just he's gonna make everything revolve around that so that, that's the only way you can handle loads like if he would if like any no, let's take him out of the picture just say anybody where are they gonna i mean if they're it just depends on where they're at because like harry the guy i was talking about he's a wildland firefighter too which 
that's some of those brutal conditioning. He said it's like much tougher than like the hiking and stuff they do with those packs up mountains. It's like brutal. So it's going to be like a lot of it's like really makeshift stuff. Like, okay, we're going to do some sort of pressing, but like, it's like, you know, an overhead press and there's like, you know, kind of rucksacks hanging off the, a stick kind of thing. So, I mean, there's no way to me- quantitatively exactly measure it. So, you know, we're going up to a five rep set with an RP of eight kind of thing. And like, obviously keep the volume really low. Because a lot of people, I think another reason it's had more success here is not getting, you know, there's two schools of thought. One is basically you just like powerlifting and maybe do something that like throws in some sort of like movement. So you're like, you're just powerlifting and like a kettlebell swing or something at the end. And like, that's a conditioning, that's a movement component. That's, there's that school of thought that's too powerful and heavy. There's the other of like, these guys really don't need any kind of strength. They're just, um, they're just like, you know, let's get them like on a, you know, ladder drills kind of thing or whatever. And, and like, you know, a kettlebell snatch and that's going to be enough strength. So I think I try to find that middle ground where we're shooting for strength. Cause I've those kind of standards I listed before to me, when you start going much beyond that, if someone's just naturally there, which would be hard to do, like, that's one thing. But like, if you start going much beyond that, you're starting to push strength for strength. And the problem with that becomes you risk injury and you, you know how much work it takes. Like generally, like when you get up to those numbers, it's like, you know, I told you my six, five to six hundred was quicker, but I'll tell you what, my six to 700 deadlift that took, you know, seven, eight hours fairly quick, but six to 700 took like four or five years of like, I'm not talking, it's like full on committed, not Mm. training, not missing workouts or anything and, and being smart about it too. So that wouldn't be worth it. Like if I was like, say in, in the military at that time, or it would not be worth committing all that time to get my deadlift up. I'd be better off maintaining that to a degree and then working on other stuff. Oh, of course. You guys are selecting Merrick for your telehealth platform needs. They have a couple different ways that they go about doing this. The first is through a self-selected experience. So there's a table talk panel, which is the full panel. That would be the panel that I personally get twice a year. That's checking everything. You name it, it's all there. The other panel is a checkup panel with a guided optimization. You're connected with a patient care coordinator and the patient care coordinator will meet with you to determine what your needs are. Thing to be able to help optimize your health or mitigate without judgment. So the discount code again is Table Talk Merrick Health for all your hormone optimization and performance needs. Today's episode is brought to you by Element, a tasty electrolyte drink mix with everything that you need and nothing that you don't. In other words, no sugar, no artificial coloring, no artificial ingredients, no gluten, no fillers, and no BS. With Element, I love the watermelon. The watermelon tastes freaking awesome. I drink one pack every day, no matter what. People that train out here, it's sitting out here for them all the time. The boxes don't last very long. Right now, Element is offering Table Talk listeners a free sample pack with any purchase. That's eight single serving packages free with any Element order. Get yours at drinkelement.com backslash Table Talk. The deal is only available through the link in the description. The other thing is if you don't like it, you can just give it away to a salty friend and Element will give you a 100% refund no risk money back guarantee head over to trankelement.com backslash table talk hey guys if you're a strength athlete coach trainer or practitioner the swiss symposium in columbus ohio at the Easton town center time's running out it's october 20 21st and we have a $200 discount running right now. As I said, seats are starting to fill. So head over to EliteFTS.com, register today.